Uh, good morning. I think it's uh, time to to get going. You guys are way back there. I think we, we need a little opera glasses or something to see the people in the back here. Uh, so it's good. Uh, we're, we'll get going on our session. Uh, this session uh, is the mini review on uh, Canada's healthy eating strategy. I think before we say anything, of course, we should uh, uh, be aware that we are on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people as well, uh, for which we're grateful. Uh, and um, so this particular session, we're going to concentrate on three different aspects of the healthy eating strategy. We've got two folks from, um, from Health Canada. I'll do a little introduction as they come up. One that's a bit more the, the, the side that has to do with public health and nutrition and the, uh, the regulatory levers that are being used in the health eating strategy. And then we've got someone from Heart and Stroke uh, Canada who's going to be talking about from an advocacy role as well and their involvement there. So uh, the way we're going to run this is um, we will try and restrict their presentations to about 15 minutes each, So we'll, and then we'll have all of the questions at the end with the panel up here. Uh, and, uh, and then we, we, we hope you'll enjoy that. I think it's been uh, uh, an interesting two and a half, three and a half years, I guess, since uh, the healthy eating strategy has been developed and going, so it'd be nice to get an update on all of these. Oh, that's right, we're supposed to introduce ourselves as well. So. Hassan Hutchinson, I'm from Health Canada, uh, co-chairing this with my, my friend Gord. Yeah, Gord Zello, University of Saskatchewan, professor in nutrition. Perfect. So let, let's get right into it because we're not leaving them an awful lot of time to go through their 50-odd slides each. Um, but uh, the, we'll start off with Dr. Will Yan, who's going to uh, introduce a bit the healthy eating strategy and then give a uh, focus really on food labeling. Dr. Yan is the director of the Bureau of Nutrition Sciences at the Food Directorate at Health Canada and certainly leading work on supplemented foods as well as the projects that the more regulatory side of the healthy eating strategy will. Uh, why don't you come and join us up here? And of course, the full bios for all of these people are included in the, uh, on the app. Uh, you can find uh, much more information there. Thank you. So, Will, your 15 minutes have started. Yeah. <laughs> Got the alarm going. Thank you very much, Hassan, and good morning, everyone. So I guess mini review means we're going to talk really, really fast. <laughs> uh, slides. So as Hassan mentioned, I'm going to spend just a few minutes to give you an introduction to Health Canada's healthy eating strategy. I'm saying most of you have already heard about this in the last couple of years. Um, then I'll get right into what I was told to talk about today, which is the two initiatives that um, focuses on labeling as part of the, the strategy. So again, for this audience, we don't have to go into a lot of details on this slide. We all know that the prevalence of chronic disease in Canada is a huge, major um, public health concern. Many Canadians, up to 44% are living with at least one of the 10 recognized chronic diseases. And it's been recognized that non-healthy eating or consumption of food high in sodium, sugar, and saturated fat contribute to the problem. So as a result of this, back in 2016, um, our minister announced um, launching a healthy eating strategy. And this slide really captures the, the basics of that. Is the, the foundation is four pillars that touches on providing better information on nutrition, improving food quality, protecting the vulnerable population, and supporting nutrition education. So again, I think many of you have seen this slide before, and over the last three years or so, we've been working really, really hard in moving some of these files forward. A number of these are regulatory files, and for those of you who know how regulations work, they don't usually work that fast. Um, the kind of work we've done over the last couple of years has been kind of lightning speed when it comes to when you're talking about regulatory development. So here are just some of the highlights of what we have done um, in, in Health Canada over the last few years. First of all, um, one that we'll be talking about today in more details is we revised our nutrition labeling regulations. So some of you have heard about this. Uh, we've made some improvement on how the nutrition facts table is going to be looking like. So I'll be talking about that in a little bit more details later. Uh, we finished the work on, on eliminating tran industrial trans fat. Um, the regulations for banning partially hydrogen oil was came into force last September. So PHO now is prohibited to be used in the food supply in Canada, and that should 
bring our trans fat consumption level to be in line with the big show recommendations. As you all know, we also introduced uh, a new set of regulations um, that went through second guess that one consultation last year, and this is called Fund of Package Nutrition Labeling. So this is meant to really complement what we've done on the NFT, and that's the second part of my presentation today that I'll give you more details on that. And Alfred will be telling you all about the food guide that was launched back in, in January, and we won't be have time to talk about marketing to kids much today, but I'm sure Manny will be talking about some of that, and we'll be happy to answer questions on that when we go to the panel. Sorry, I'm talking in my, uh, usually this is the speed I always talk in my, when I teach my class that I only got one lecture left to cover five chapters, so. Um, I will go through some of the slides quickly. I, I'm not sure if the slides will be provided. I think they, yeah. if they, they will be, they will be yeah. so a lot of that will be for your information to take away after the, the session. So before we get into labeling, just want to remind you that you know the food label is a very busy place all over the package of the food. But from a regulatory standpoint, it really comes down to three parts. We have health, in this pyramid on the top, we have health claims, then we have nutrient content claims, and then finally we have the NFT. So the thing to remember here is just briefly is that the first two health claims and nutrient content claims are voluntary. These are put in there by companies if they would choose to, but if they choose to put it on there, then they have to do it according to the regulations of, that would tell them how they can do it and what they need to be um, adhering to. And then the bottom of the pyramid, the NFT, this is actually mandatory for most pre-packaged foods, and they have to display the NFT in the way that is asked for in the regulations. So all these come into play in providing information to consumers about the nutritional <coughs> quality or the content of a food. So many of you are familiar with this. You look at this every day when you go shopping, I'm sure, and before you buy the food. At least that's what we hope people would be doing. Um, on the, in this slide, on the left-hand side is what you would see in most packages today. So this is the original NFT that was put into place back in about 2003. And then the green new version is the one that we finalized in Gazette 2 back in the end of 2016. I don't have time to go through all the changes that were made, but some of the highlights are that we have made the serving size more consistent, and that was the number one complaint we heard from consumers, is that it was very hard for them to compare foods when the serving sizes are all over the map. So we've tried to do our best to make them more consistent, so they can compare to similar foods and, and choose the one that may be healthier for them. We've also updated um, many of the DVs, and we have now done, used a regular tool to make further updating in the future easier without having to open the regulation every time the science changes. Um, we've replaced some of the, the core nutrients based on the latest consumption data, and also we've included a footnote in the bottom that would let consumers know how to use the DV. So the simple 515 rule that 5% is a, a, just a little bit of a nutrient and 15% or higher is a lot of a nutrient. So these are, these are some of the, the major changes we've made that we truly believe that the new table now is gonna be more user-friendly and more informative for the general public that don't have a lot of experience or knowledge about nutrition. At the same time, we also updated the ingredient list. This is also another very important part of the label that consumers should be looking at. The first thing we decided to do is just make it more legible. I guess that's number one. Doesn't matter what information you have on there, your people can't read it, it's not gonna do much good. So we've changed the background color, the font size, the use of both capital and lowercase lettering, all these things to make sure that as the population ages, that especially senior population can see the label information clearly. The other major thing we changed, we did was um, we grouped the, num the sugar ingredients together, again, to highlight if a product is high in different forms of sugar. What I didn't mention earlier was that another big change with the NFT was that we introduced for the first time a DV for total sugar. So that's really, really aiming at providing information to consumers about the sugar content of a prepackaged food. So, all these changes that have been made, again, they have been now already passed through regulations, and we've given industry five years to change all the labels, especially for the smaller companies to have time to, to make a label change. That also gives us some time to do some education, and this is hot off the press. We've been working on um, a, a tool to help 
healthcare professionals and educators to let them um, help consumers to use the new NFT when it comes to the market in full scale in, in, in 2021. So this is an online tool, it's, it's self-paced, it's got different modules that really walk you through the changes in the NFT, how you're supposed to use different parts of the NFT in guiding you through making a choice. We're just doing some testing on this right now, both through focus group and, and online, and we hope to roll this out by early 2020. So just in time to help all the educators and, and health care professionals. Okay, so that was a speed through vision labeling, NFT. What, what does that time say? It's upside down, it says 6.47 left. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's upside down. <laughs> <laughs> You, okay. still, you still have a green light though. That's okay, good. So the second half is on front of package labeling. Again, I hope most of you have heard of this before and actually have commented through our CG1 process. So as I said earlier, on the front of the package is a pretty busy place. There's a lot of information on there. There's branding, there's company's name, there's the promotional material. And in some cases, they also put both health claims and or nutrient content claims on the front. The NFT is usually displays either on the side or on the back of a package. So if a person doesn't actually take the package off the shelf, they may not actually see the NFT, but they will see all the more positive messaging that is on, located on the front of a package. So really, one of the major objectives of the FOP is to provide more information, more balanced information, you know, so that if not every consumer has time to turn the package over to, to look at NFT, at least they'll get a photo picture of what the food looks like when they look at the front of the package. And it's meant to really complement the NFT, not to replace it. So the idea is we targeted food that are high in what we call the three nutrients of public health concern, which is sodium, sugar, and saturated fat. And bottom line is if any food is higher than, in general, 15% DV threshold of these three nutrients, then they'll be required to carry a symbol that will indicate that this food is high in one of those nutrients. And this will be look, then put onto a specific place on the front of the package so that consumer can get this information right away to balance it with whatever information that could be high in fiber, high in calcium, so they can make a judge of whether this food is actually appropriate for them. So this slide really summarizes all the different elements of what the regulatory uh, proposal was, and it, it speaks to, there were four symbols that were consulted on as possibilities, the location, the size, and the threshold that would trigger the, net, the requirement for the symbol. And also, there were some lists of exemptions of certain products that would not have to carry the symbol, even though they may be over 15%. And this could be due to evidence that these, these foods or these, um, these foods actually have other healthy attributes, and or it may be redundant that people already know that these foods are high in these nutrients. So this went through our regulatory consultation process called a set one. So we did it in two parts. We did a consultation more aimed at consumers only on the four symbols because we really have to land on which of the four symbols as shown here should be used in the final regulations. And over the period, we received over 16,000 comments from Canadians telling what, which symbol they prefer. At the same time, we also did our more traditional gate consultation, which is on the fine details of regulation. And on that, we receive over 200 unique submissions that speak to all the different parts of the, the regulatory proposal. So while we were looking at those, waiting for those comments to come in, we also did some further consumer research. We looked at a real life situation where we went to a retail food lab where we had mock packages that carry different symbols or no symbols and we tested how consumers actually chose and how they would actually look at the new symbol that we put into the products. And at the same time, we also did another online mock package trial, again, to nail down more the, the requirement on size, the location, and, and things like that about the proposal. So this is just a quick picture of what the, on, the, the simulated grocery store looks like. So people come in, they got these special eye-tracking glasses, and they were able to do a real life shopping experience, looking at products that either with or without a symbol. And this is the online uh, mock package trial that we did, again, more testing for the fine details of the, the proposal. 
So after the consultation, this slide really just does, does a high level summary of what, what we heard. Not surprisingly, consumers strongly supported having this extra information on the front. They all, they all like the attention grabbing um, quality of these proposed symbols. And we also find out that they really like to have that Health Canada kind of like a logo or Health Canada wording in the bottom of the symbol. That to them lent more credibility and made them actually think that the symbol is trustworthy. That's kind of nice to know that they still think Health Canada is trustworthy. Um, also, not surprisingly, um, from health stakeholders, they also strongly supported this mandatory FOP proposal. There were some specific recommendations where they, in some cases, they wanted to go even further with what a symbol could look like, or they didn't like some of the exemptions that we were proposing. And they all highlighted that the need to also have consumer research and education backing uh, the proposal. Industry, again, not surprisingly, they were not as positive about this um, labeling proposal. They thought that the, any one of the four symbols would give a kind of negative messaging to turn people off eating a food. Um, they didn't really like some of the thresholds or the limitation on the format and, and where they have to put the symbol. And they also wanted a minimum of four years so that they can get ready if the regulations were passed. They need four years to get ready for getting the symbols ready and also in some cases maybe reformulate to not to have to put a symbol on. So moving forward, um, we are aiming, so obviously again, the NFT work has already been done. It's just more now reaching out, educating, and, and, and getting people used to seeing the new symbols. We are starting to see some of the new NFT out already, actually, on, on some packages, which is a good sign. Um, we are still aiming to publish the final regulation of the FOP package in Gazette 2 in the near future. We know that for this government, the clock's ticking a little bit. We still have some time to get into, into CG2. Um, if not, then we'll have a look at maybe a future timeline for publishing the, these regulations. Um, in the regulation, we did put in that there will be a four-year transition time so that we allow uh, industry to make one label change at all, all at once to satisfy all the changes that are made on the food label, both from Health Canada as well as the CFIA has also been proposing some changes on the label that is non-health and safety um, measures. So all these transition periods will have to be adjusted depending on when the FOP comes into force, but the whole idea is that they should all be aligned to the extent possible to try to save the cost and keep the potential increase in cost of the food supply to a minimum. I don't believe I actually did that in 15 minutes. Yeah, you did. No. Good job. <laughs> we're going to have you sit over here so okay. we're ready for when we move into the panel. Um, now I'd like to introduce... <laughs> the uh, Dr. Alfred Aziz, who has been with Health Canada since 2006, I believe, came in as a postdoctoral fellow and then as a research scientist. And I believe it was back about five years ago, you took over as the Chief of Nutrition Regulations and Standards Division in the, sort of the, in the, over in the Food Directorate. And then earlier this year, he's come in as the new Director General of the Office of Nutrition... <laughs> I should know this, shouldn't I? <laughs> nutrition <laughs> <laughs> Policy and Promotion. <laughs> you can see why they're throwing the old guy out here. He can't even remember the name of the office anymore. So, uh, well, well, Alfred, could you please come up and tell them about the food guide before I forget what that was all about myself. So. Oh, I did not know there were steps there. Okay. <laughs> so, so thank you, everyone. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to probably as fast as Will was because English is my third language. If I start talking too fast, then you're going to hear a little bit of French, a little bit of Arabic, a little bit of English, and God knows what. And so, but I will talk about the food guide, and probably all of you have heard about the food guide already, but it's a good, it's a good time to kind of recap of the great work that Hassan and the team at the Office of Nutrition Policy and Promotion did. <laughs> I don't want to take the credit for that, so, but I have a huge responsibility over my shoulder to carry on the good work. So I'll give you a little bit of a background. We'll talk a little bit about the evidence and the engagement, but then the, mo most of the, of the presentation will focus on what's new in Canada's food guide. We'll talk a little bit at the end what's still next to come. 
Um, so I don't want to spend too much time over the background. I'll just want to quote uh, Dr. Yoni Friedhoff, who's present here, I think. I, I haven't, s where are you? But <laughs> anyway, he's so he's in the back. Oh, you're in the back. Oh, <laughs> that's very <laughs> strange. Back, so uh, nobody put it better than Yoni when he said at, uh, I don't know if you've seen some of the coverage before the launch of the food guide in January, where he actually said something that was very insightful. He said, the food guide unconsciously became this nutrition conscious of the nation, conscience of the nation. And that's very true because it's so widely integrated into policies and programs, as well as the resources all over the country, whether it's in the provinces, provinces and territories, uh, uh, stakeholders, even the food industry use the food guide, for example, to make some marketing claims on, on their products. So um, th that's really point to the importance of the food guide. The reason why we needed to revise it is because we needed to address some challenges with respect to the use of the food guide. For example, we heard from consumers that they had really troubles understanding and using the serving sizes and the number of servings in their daily lives. But so we wanted to provide the right information to the right audience. We also wanted to update uh, the, the guide to reflect the uh, most recent uh, evidence, best available evidence with respect to nutrients of concerns, food, as well as dietary patterns. So let's take a look, quick look at how we gather the evidence that underpinned the, the food guide. So what we really focused on is getting evidence from three major sources. We wanted to focus on the scientific basis of the evidence, so looking at relationships between foods, nutrients, and health, but we also wanted to understand the relevance to the Canadian context and how the food guide has been used in the past so that we can actually make improvements to the way we communicate dietary guidance. So when we, I'm going to just focus for the moment at the, uh, relation, at the evidence underpinning the relationships between food, nutrients, and health. We only considered uh, reports from credible scientific organizations such as the WHO, the World Cancer Research Fund International, the American College of Cardiology, etc., to basically uh, look at the evidence. So these, these high-quality reports that have been published all had looked at systematic reviews. They either commissioned their own systematic review or they did a review of systematic reviews. These organizations as well had uh, established an expert scientific panel, and it's an independent group of experts, to, to look and grade the evidence. And so this is one, uh, uh, ensuring another level of quality in terms of looking at the evidence. And only evidence that was considered convincing by these expert panels was actually used to develop recommendations with re in relation to food, nutrients, and health. Um, some of the exclusion criteria, we did not consider reports and systematic reviews that were particularly and directly commissioned by industry or an organization with a business interest. Um, we did not uh, focus on outcome that is outside the scope of the scan. So if, if the outcome of the systematic review looked at evidence related to the treatment of a particular chronic disease or condition, we did not consider that. We wanted to be able to apply the, the, the findings to recommendations for the general public. So when we looked at the evidence, we really looked over uh, 45 high-quality scientific reports from uh, respected authorities, as I mentioned. We extracted the data, organized it, and captured the evidence great. There were over approximately 2,000 findings as of December 2018. We engaged internal and external experts to, to review that evidence to see if there were gaps. We assessed the findings, and what we came out with is over 400 convincing conclusions were included that informed the relationships between food, nutrients, and health in our dietary recommendations. When it comes to engagement, really what we wanted to do is to make sure that the um, food guide is, uh, is based on, re on responsible and meaningful engagement. We consulted extensively to ensure that the resources are evidence-based, useful, and relevant to all Canadians. We held two broad public consultations, one in the fall of 2016 and the other in the summer of 2017, and these were open to everybody, due to, to consumers, to health professionals, to provinces and territories, as well to the food industry. But we also conducted targeted consultation with specific groups to make sure that the uh, food guide is relevant, because they were the, be the ones who are going to use the food guide or integrate it in their policies and programs. So we, we consulted with experts, we consulted with provincial and territorial governments, with other federal departments, with indigenous experts, we consulted with national indigenous organizations, health 
professionals and health charities. We wanted to ensure that the process of revising the food guide is open and transparent and mitigate any potential conflict of interest. For this reason, what we have done is that we took different approaches. First, we really summarized the results of our consultation in what we call in the bureaucratic jargon what we heard reports. But what we also have done is that officials within the, the uh, Office of Nutrition Policy and Promotion did not meet with uh, industry representatives during the development of the food guide. Any other meeting or correspondence with other Health Canada officials were actually captured in our web, on our website on a table that basically provides the name of the organization that we met with as well as the topic of the discussion and any relevant materials. And you can order these materials online from that table. So uh, I'm gonna start talking about the food guide in a second, but what we really wanted to, to, to make sure is that, as I mentioned, that the food guide is user-centric, so that basically it targets the audience that it's supposed to be targeting, and it could be different types of audiences. We applied a health literacy lens so that you know people with, low, with marginal or at risk of marginal health literacy can actually understand the recommendations. We took into consideration the diversity of the Canadian population, so it was tested with a range of ages, household incomes, location, and cultural backgrounds. We also took into consideration other factors such as social determinants of health, cultural diversity, and the, uh, and indigenous, uh, the historical context of indigenous peoples. So, the new food guide is actually not a single document. It is an online suite of resources that are targeted to different audiences. We have the Canada's Dietary Guidelines for Health Professionals and Policymakers. We have the Food Guide Snapshot, which is basically a very at-a-glance type of <coughs> communication product for Canadians. We have videos, recipes, and actionable advice in the form of tips throughout the Food Guide web content. And we also have the evidence reports that underpin the, um, the recommendations. So I'll focus today's talk on the uh, Canada's Dietary Guidelines for Health Professional and Policymakers. So guideline one is basically talks about the foundation of healthy eating. And what it says is that vegetables, fruit, whole grains, and protein food should be consumed regularly, and among protein foods to consume plant-based more often. Really, the Canadian context underpinning that recommendation is that Canadians eat, do not eat much fruit, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, as well as plant-based protein. But the evidence that supports this recommendation is plentiful. We have evidence that, pat convincing evidence, and all this evidence is convincing, by the way, that patterns of eating that emphasize plant-based food result in higher intakes of vegetables and fruit, and uh, fruits, nuts, soy, and fiber and lower intakes of processed meats and foods that contain mostly saturated fat. We know that eating more vegetables than fruit is linked to lower risk of cardiovascular disease. And we know that processed meat has been linked to colorectal cancer and that food that contain mostly saturated fat are linked to unfavorable blood lipid levels, uh, which is uh, mostly LDL cholesterol and a higher risk of type two diabetes. When I emphasize here that protein foods that form the basis of healthy eating include both animal and plant-based protein foods, even though we make put more emphasis on plant-based protein. So you can see here, for example, in the types of animal food, we have fish, shellfish, eggs, poultry, lean meats, including game, as well as lower fat dairy products. So when we talk about lower fat dairy and lean meats, the, the intention here is not to reduce the intake of total fat. Actually, we did not find any convincing evidence that reducing total fat is linked to favorable health outcome. The intention is really that to, by, re, by reducing saturated fat and, uh, and replacing it with unsaturated fat, we lower the levels of LDL cholesterol, which is a well-established factor for, the, uh, for, for cardiovascular disease risk. Now, there are a lot of controversy around saturated fat, and you probably hear in the media as well in the near future that there is, you know, not enough evidence, but the type of evidence that we are looking at is the totality of the evidence. And we look at a broad range of outcomes, including uh, disease outcomes, but also biomarker outcomes, because these are well-established biomarkers for the risk of cardiovascular disease. 
The third, the third important aspect of uh, the uh, guideline one about the foundation of healthy eating is that water should be the beverage of choice. Um, one of the reasons why is when we look at, at consumption of beverages among, among Canadians, we see that in 2015, sugary drinks, which encompass regular soft drinks, energy drinks, uh, sweetened milks, um, and fruit juice, etc., they, all they are all the highest contributor of total sugars among Canadians, especially among uh, children and youth between the age of 9 to 18. So we wanted to really promote the message that water should be the beverage of choice because it does not provide extra calories because it's actually the best source of hydration uh, for, for people. We now move to guideline two, which is really the beverages that undermine healthy eating, foods and beverages that undermine healthy eating. And here what we're saying is that process or prepared food and beverages that contribute to excess sodium, free sugars, or saturated fat, which we commonly refer to as highly processed food, undermine healthy eating and should not be consumed regularly. Um, we all know there are a lot of uh, studies that have shown now that in recent years, the availability and consumption of highly processed food has increased significantly in Canada, which has resulted in also decreased food skills and uh, ability of Canadians to prepare meals from scratch. So um, we wanted to kind of try to uh, remove, to basically reverse that trend. And the evidence that support that kind of recommendation is that when consumed on a regular basis, these types of food lead to excess intakes of these nutrients of concern, which are associated with chronic disease risk. Food skills is an important aspect of the new food guide. So the new food guide does not only talk mm -hmm. about what to eat or what not to eat, but also how to eat. Cooking and food preparation using nutritious food should be promoted as a practical way to support healthy eating. I mentioned earlier that fewer Canadians are able to make meals from, uh, from basic ingredients. Uh, we know that the increased use of uh, highly processed food decreased the transfer of food skills among children and adolescents. And we're really looking to uh, improving f food skills by cooking and preparing food homes can really contribute to improved food choices and eating behaviors especially among, uh, as well, indigenous people where, you know, the traditional and cultural foods are important for health and well-being. Another important aspect of food skills is to promote the use of uh, <coughs> food labels as a tool to help Canadians make informed food choices. Uh, they are the major source of uh, information for Canadians when it comes to nutrition, when they are out shopping, and we want to really kind of encourage Canadians to keep using the nutrition, uh, nutrition facts table. But also, as Will mentioned, we're introducing different tools to help Canadians. We're proposing a different tool to help Canadians make healthier food choices at a glance, especially among those who, ha who are at risk of marginal health literacy who may have difficulties understanding and using the nutrition facts table. Now, the food guide is a great tool, but there is a lot of pressure that, or a lot of perception that the food guide should resolve the issue of healthy eating, in, of unhealthy eating in Canada. And this is not the case. The food guide is a tool that provides advice about healthy eating to Canadians. It is not the tool that is going to solve other systemic barriers to healthy eating. So program and policies that are integrated within different jurisdictions, uh, the progress and the policies of stakeholders, everybody has a role to play. And what we really are focusing on is that we need to try to create supportive environments that enable Canadians to actually use the food guide and implement it in their daily lives. Last but not least, we're gonna, no, not, that's not last but not least, but this is a really kind of uh, quick overview of the food guide snapshot. These are the resources for Canadians. So as I mentioned earlier, it just provides a quick at a glance information about the food guide. But then if you really go deeper, you will find that this is really just the tip of the iceberg. The web content for the food guide is not just those two pages. There's plenty of information, plenty of resources, plenty of tips that are beneath the surface. And I just strongly encourage everyone to go and, and dig deeper and find these resources and tips. There are great resources for healthy eating on a budget, 
There are great resources for uh, making healthy snacks. There are great recipes that are food guide compliant. There are tips for, uh, for seniors, for adolescents, you name it. So the really, it's, it's a very rich resource and we strongly encourage you to explore it. So what's next to come? Uh, we're really trying to be, um, uh, to listen to the feedback that we have received from Canadians and stakeholders with the new food guide. We, we're going to be releasing additional material or additional resources in 2019 and further on. So we will continue to release material as evidence, um, you know, as we do more work, as evidence emerges, we are committed to continuing to monitor the evidence. Uh, we're trying also to reach diverse audiences. We are in the process of translating the food guide snapshot into international and indigenous languages to increase awareness uh, of the food guide among newcomers especially. And we'll be working closely with uh, Indigenous Services Canada as well as no, uh, national indigenous organizations to support the development of distinctions-based tool on healthy eating for uh, indigenous people. So, I was not that bad, actually, so thank you so much for your attention, and I will be happy to take some of your questions later. Thank you. And, and I guess this is where the last, but not certainly not least, uh, the, our third speaker is uh, Manuel Arango, who is the Director of Policy, Advocacy, and Engagement for Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada. Manny, come on up. And uh, Manny, as well as leading all of the policy development uh, side of things, he acts as, a, as a, a media spokesperson for the foundation on, a, on all of these real issues and being very, very instrumental, I think, in terms of moving the bar on Canadians' reflections on the whole health eating strategy as well. So come on up and, and give your 55 slides. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so my challenge is 53 slides in 15 minutes. I think it's doable. There, I'll be fa fairly quick with them. Um, so uh, my objective is to talk about Heart and Stroke's perspective on the healthy eating strategy as well as the NGO role in the, in the healthy eating strategy. Uh, I like to look at public policy issues and nutrition initiatives in terms of John Kingdom's public policy process model. And he says basically you need to have a problem you need to have policy tools to address the problem, and then you have to have political willingness to act on, on these tools and implement them. Um, so when you have all three of these, you get a window of opportunity that develops. So it's incumbent upon civil society and government to work together to ensure that action is taken. So what's the problem stream? Well, we have diet-related disease uh, that costs us 26 billion annually in Canada. Fruit and vegetable consumption is very low. Uh, we know that there's an increasing amount of calories uh, that are consumed in Canada that come from highly processed foods. It's almost 60% of our calories amongst 19, 9 to 13 year olds, in fact. Obesity rates are high and sugary drinks are a real issue. They're a leading source of sugar consumption amongst 1 to 8 year olds. And uh, we do know that youth consume almost a bathtub of sugary drinks per year. So it's a real issue. As well, ultra, food, uh, ultra processed food consumption, that is junk food consumption, is a problem. And we know from several prominent institutions that they have d indicated that widely advertised ultra processed foods are, do, are, is, are in fact associated with uh, obesity and overweight. Um, Jean-Claude Mubarak from the University of Montreal uh, has produced research where he looked at energy availability from uh, ready-to-consume products and ultra-processed food products and found that there was a huge increase over several decades um, in the energy coming from these foods, uh, a basically a doubling in those uh, energy from those foods over this time period. Um, we do, of course, know that uh, to address overweight and obesity, it's not uh, one single intervention that's going to do the trick. Uh, we need multiple interventions, and the food industry likes to say that, you know, uh, addressing marketing to kids, that's not a magic bullet. Well, it's correct. It's an important part of the solution, but you've got to do many things. So I think that is what is happening through the, the healthy eating strategy. Um, we have policy tools that have been introduced. And in the government, in, in its election platform, and in the Prime Minister's mandate letter to the Health Minister, 
these were all included. So there is political willingness. Um, as has been indicated already, food guide and trans fat regulations, we've got check marks there, they've been done. We're looking to finish uh, the issue of restricting marketing of unhealthy foods and beverages to kids and front of pack labeling. So just very quickly with trans fats, it was back in the mid-90s that Canada was leading the pack in terms of uh, trans fat consumption. Uh, so this was a real concern, and this prompted the passage of a parliamentary motion that was pushed forward by, a, by an NDP MP, Pat Martin, and a Conservative MP, Stephen Fletcher. Uh, that motion called for the striking of a task force co-chaired by Health Canada and Heart and Stroke to address this issue. Um, and at the very end of the day, after a long process in September 2017, a measure was introduced to prohibit partially hydrogenated oils, which leads to trans fats, creation of artificial trans fats. And that measure came into effect in September 2018. So all told, 13 years from start to finish, and sometimes that is how long the, um, the public policy advocacy process takes. Uh, Heart and Stroke, as well as many other organizations, were very active in the media on this issue, and we were very active communicating to parliamentarians uh, about the issue as well. Um, with respect to the food guide, it was definitely necessary. We, we did not have modern, modern guidance that reflected modern realities and, and new evidence with respect to nutrition, in particular as it pertains to highly processed foods and sugary drinks and things like 100% fruit juice that used to be an alternative to fruits in the old food guide. So it was necessary. Our perspective was, uh, which was indicated and highlighted I think quite well in our position on saturated fats, um, our position is very much consistent with the Brazilian food guide. Focus on the consumption of whole real foods, limit highly processed foods, avoid sugary drinks, and uh, limit eating out, etc. cetera. Uh, the food guide acted on all of these issues, I believe. <clears throat> I could, the one little tweak or exception would be that instead of saying avoid sugary drinks, it says limit the consumption of sugary drinks. But all, well, all, all told, very, very good piece produced by Health Canada with respect to the food guide. And as I mentioned, uh, Fruit Juice has had this health halo, and Yanni Friedhoff has been very active over the years um, in, in convincing the public and others to, to remove it as an alternative uh, to, um, to fruits. It, the food guide was launched in, in January of 2019, and it received unprecedented positive media coverage both before and after the launch. And our takeaway from this and our message to government officials is, you see, nutrition initiatives are positive politics. And for me, the narrative that came out of this is that um, public policy, healthy public policy, trumps corporate inference, influence. And this really resonated with Canadians. So our role, as it is with many initiatives, is uh, we cooperated with experts to produce op-eds, did media releases, submitted briefs to Health Canada, participated in parliamentary committees, met with officials, etc. And we also commissioned a study through Jean-Claude Mubarak at the University of Montreal um, and in, back in December 2017, and it found that 60% of 19 th to 13 year olds get their calories from ultra processed foods. Uh, 50 uh, media interviews resulted from the release of this report. That's just one of the things that we do to support. With respect to the marketing of unhealthy foods and beverages, another issue that Heart and Stroke has been very active in over the years. Uh, we participated and um, led a consensus conference along with co uh, part other partners in 2008 on this issue, put out position statements, uh, been an active partner in a coalition to address this particular issue. And in 2017, we put out a report, our Heart Month report, entitled The Kids Are Not All Right. This study was based on, um, uh, this report was based on a study and research undertaken by Manik Potman Kent from the University of Ottawa. And it found that over 90% of food and beverage products uh, viewed by kids and teens online are unhealthy, and that kids see 25 million food and beverage ads a year on their favorite websites. As well, in the report, there was quite a bit of data, public opinion related data, and we found that Canadians strongly support and believe that food and beverages uh, are advertised to kids are unhealthy. Uh, they believe that 
kids are exposed to too much unhealthy food and beverage adver advertising from the food and beverage industry, and that the food and beverage industry has a huge advantage over parents because they pump over a billion dollars in advertising annually um, on this issue. And we also know that Canadians strongly support restrictions on marketing of uh, unhealthy foods and beverages to kids. So all of this led, all of these concerns led to some action uh, by Senator Nancy Green Rain, who is a conservative senator, retired now, who in 20, September 2016 introduced a bill to address this particular issue. One year later, the Senate unanimously passed the bill. Uh, one year later after that, the House of Commons passed the bill with a large majority. It then went back to the Senate in September 2018, and it's been stalled there for eight months. So we've been very busy uh, meeting with senators, encouraging them to get this passed. Um, once it's passed, regulations will be the next step. However, if it's not passed before June, we worry that it will be another 25 years before we get a chance uh, to get a bill of this type passed. Uh, so our perspective on marketing to kids in the early stages was that we would have preferred for the bill to address all food and beverage marketing because then we could have avoided um, the hassle of having to define what's unhealthy and what's healthy. Um, and as well, we would have preferred that adolescents and youth were included and, and not just kids. However, that wasn't possible, um, maybe an, another day. Um, we are also, with respect to the regulatory phase, when we get there, if we get there, hopefully, uh, we, we are, it's gonna be very important that it be very comprehensive. Uh, food marketing occurs in different mediums and settings, online, on product packaging, um, it's important to address company-generated cartoon characters. Company brands can sometimes be associated with many unhealthy products, so those would have to be looked at. And uh, there is an exemption in Senator Nancy Green's Wayne's bill for, um, for kids' community sports. Those could still be sponsored. So we, make, we have to make sure those are not, that is not exploited. So in the month of March alone, Heart and Stroke, along with its partners, did a number of things uh, worked with a number of folks to put out op-eds. Um, we have uh, advertised these op-eds with senators, been very active in social media, worked with Peter Mansbridge to send a letter to all senators. The Cancer Society communicated with all senators through email blasts. Um, we uh, the also food foundation supporters, such as the McConnell Foundation and others, they signed a letter and sent it in to all senators, had meetings. Um, and a lot of activity has taken place. And in particular, I'll highlight one particular piece that you would fi you'll find in your conference bag. Um, it was an insert, and it, um, it, it relates to an e-advocacy campaign that was launched in March 20, on March 27th. And it basically was a request that was sent to about 175,000 Canadians to sign a letter, send an email in, to senators regarding this particular issue. It was promoted on social media, and our objective was to get 2,000 emails in to all senators, and to date, we've gotten over 4,000. So, so this is very positive, and it's a snapshot of some of the work that's been going on. With respect to front of pack labeling, we know that the nutrition facts table, it's useful, but it's not um, the only thing that we need to do in order to convey nutrition information to Canadians. Um, it can sometimes be difficult for some Canadians to understand, particular people with um, uh, uh, visual impairments or uh, literacy issues, seniors, et cetera. So we do support Health Canada's approach to front of pack labeling, uh, where you use an alert symbol for uh, high in um, um, nutrients of food that, have, that are high in certain nutrients. And what we do know from the evidence is that these labels have to be easy to understand, prominent, visible, and interpretive. That means people can take under, um, uh, act on them and, and, um, and change their behavior. So in Chile, Chile was actually the first country that used this approach, and they used stop signs. So these are examples of the Canadian approach, which um, have already been discussed earlier today. Industry does, prefers a different approach. They like the traffic light symbol approach because it's confusing. Um, 
there's a lot of colors, there's lots of numbers, there's lots of percentages, and although the public finds it attractive, they have no takeaway from this type of approach. The perfect example is the, the soda bottle uh, on the right here. You'll see that he has green symbols for uh, low in sa uh, saturated fat, low in sodium, but high in sugar. So what's the consumer supposed to take from this? Uh, that it's a healthy uh, product to consume because it has two green symbols. So, so this is a very confusing approach. Um, and here's just examples of how th the symbol would look on packages. It'll be very prominent, and there's going to be a lot of ex a number of exemptions for whole real foods that uh, Will has already spoken about. From our perspective, we, we do support this approach. We would like to have encouraged Health Canada to consider a little bit of flexibility when it comes to dairy products and saturated fats. Uh, there have been some studies that have come out recently that have demonstrated that over the long term there's no impact on heart disease mortality um, when it comes to saturated fats in certain dairy products. I'm not talking about chocolate milk there, that's not, that's not an example, but there's certain dairy products where it, it, this could be, um, should be entertained. Um, as well, we have communicated to Health Canada that we need to make sure that positive nutrient content claims don't dwarf the alert symbols uh, are the high-end symbols, as you can see here. So in terms of timelines, uh, Will talked about this already, consultations have taken place. Canada Gazette was launched part one in February 2018, but we're almost one and a half years later and we're waiting for Canada Gazette part two. So we're quite worried. For this reason, we've put a lot of newspaper ads in the Hill Times and other newspapers um, calling on, on MPs to support this particular initiative. Uh, we've done a lot of other things, submitted uh, submissions, appeared before committees, did public opinion polling, um, and published quite a few open letters in the parliamentary newspaper in conjunction with our partners, the Canadian Medical Association, Dietitians of Canada, many other organizations, and also medical experts have sent letters in to senators um, uh, calling for passage of the Marketing to Kids Bill, all in the parliamentary newspaper. So we've been supporting the advertising budget of the parliamentary newspaper with this. Um, as well, one recent ad that we put out uh, related to budget 2019, we congratulated the government uh, for taking action on trans fats and the food guide, and we applauded the government as well for committing in budget 2019 to move forward with improved food labeling and marketing to kids. So we're encouraging the government to get this done before June. Uh, bottom line is Canadians support this work. We've done a lot of public opinion polling, and we know that this is the case. And this is important because the industry is very busy using its tactics of delay, delay divide, deflect, and deny. And they've been putting forward all kinds of spurious misinformation um, about, you know, the sky is going to fall, the lot, job, we're going to lose all kinds of jobs if we move forward with these initiatives, cost of groceries is going to go up if we have front of pack labeling. Um, we've heard all kinds of messages of this type in the past and we've been busy refuting them with, um, with the officials. So just to conclude, um, civil society has a critical role in influencing and supporting public policy and persistence is key. That's the lesson we've learned with trans fats and uh, it's important to take advantage of windows of opportunities. So after we get front of pack labeling and marketing if uh, kids done, what's the next step in the next mandate potentially? Perhaps create a healthy, living a healthy eating initiative uh, such as subsidizing fruit and veg vegetables. Um, and it could be funded from a sugary drink levy. Coordinating provincial menu labeling action is a possible action by the federal government, and as well um, implementing a national school pro uh, lunch program or, or breakfast program, which was committed to in the recent federal budget. These are all possible actions. So thank you very much, and that's it for me. Okay, we tried really hard to keep everybody on time, but for some reason, 15 minutes disappeared. Um, but we have time for a couple questions, I think. There are microphones, if you could go to them. And uh, I know there's another session in here at 11, so we don't, uh, maybe that, that group could, you know, they're welcome to start coming up and getting set up uh, so we can take a couple questions anyways. Can't see anything here, Hi there. so just go ahead. Hello. Hi, Kevin Hall from the NIH. Um, I have a 
a question. This is all really encouraging, and, and I congratulate everyone on the work on this. I'm just wondering, has there been any thought to monitoring the effectiveness of, of this rollout and um, getting some data on whether or not people are paying attention, trying to change their diet to match the guidelines? Um, what effect is this having? I think it's a really important to kind of start to monitor the effects of these kinds of programs and changes. Thanks, Kevin. This is a great question. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Monitoring is actually one big part of the work that we're going to be rolling out as we uh, uh, implement those uh, initiatives. So uh, there will be like monitoring for each initiative by itself, but there will also be like a broader monitoring um, around the healthy eating strategy because we know that not a single initiative in it by itself will kind of make a dent. So we, the, the indicators for each initiative will be focusing on what the initiative actually is trying to do, but we will be also monitoring through a broader kind of a plan with respect to changes in the food supply, like how industry is reacting, is, is responding to, for example, front of package labeling, how they are responding to, uh, there are other initiatives that we haven't that talked about today, like voluntary sodium reduction, uh, how industry is responding to uh, restriction of marketing to kids in terms of the food supply, but also in terms of what Canadians are eating. It's very unfortunate, and this is like a, a kind of a call to action maybe, that um, we don't have like similar nutrition inform, uh, surveys in Canada as, we, as you guys do have in the US. Like we don't have the NHANES, which is roll out every second year, uh, every couple of years, but we do have the Canadian Community Health Survey so the last one that we've done was 2015 is providing like the baseline data for a lot of these initiatives. And the one before that was 2004. So we're really looking now into how we can uh, leverage and partner with, uh, with experts uh, to basically try to get this information out the door more often or on a regular basis so that we can actually monitor the, how Canadians are changing their eating habits. So absolutely it is, um, monitoring will be a very important aspect of this plan and we're kind of like working towards developing the indicators for each specific initiative and for a broader strategy uh, in general. And I would just add one, one very quick point. When the Marketing to Kids bill was amended in the House of Common, Commons, uh, there was a five-year review monitoring period um, that was included in the new version of the bill. So it will be looking to assess if there's any gaps um, in, in the bill and, and the impact of the bill. One last question over here, I, and the speakers will be around, so if you have other questions, you can talk to them. Uh, quick question, quick answer. Hi there, so Yoni Friedhoff, I, 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 it is strange to be fond of the food guide for me, uh, but I am. Uh, that said, and I, I blogged about this once, I'm wondering if there are plans in that next iteration of collateral that's coming out from Health Canada uh, on the food guide and its use, if there will be an explicit page and discussion around nutrition and sports and children, uh, because I feel it's a very important area for uh, comment from Health Canada and the food guide uh, for parents, for coaches, because of the way uh, food is used on the sidelines. Thank you. Thanks, Yoni. Um, it's an excellent question. I don't really have an answer for you right now. Uh, originally, when we looked at the food guide and the resources that were planned, we do have a, on the website a kind of a limited information with respect talking about the importance of physical activity, but we do not quite address the issue of the relationship between nutrition and sports. And I can see that you know there 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 is a lot of interest because a lot of certain types of food are basically being promoted and marketed as to support uh, physical activity. I think that we certainly can look into what kind of messages we can put out. Um, that work is, as I mentioned earlier, that the, the updates to the food guide are not going to be like, you know, um, definitive in time, like there is only a discrete one-time update. The update will build and will be on a regular basis as we gather more information, more feedback, like this one that you just provided, and what are some of the gaps, and we can always make uh, additional resources to support Canadians. 
Okay, thank you very much. Please uh, join me in welcoming, or uh, thanking our speakers and welcoming them. Thank you. Uh, I encourage, I encourage everybody to stay for the next session. This is a session for young professionals and they'll be uh, presenting their work. So if, if you have the time, please stick around and support uh, um, our young professionals. Thank you. I shouldn't say young, new professionals. Okay, good afternoon, or good morning everyone. We're gonna get started here with the next session right away. So welcome to the Pecha Kucha on food environments. My name is Catherine Ford and I'm a PhD student from the University of Alberta and a member of the SNP Executive Committee. Uh, so today, judging for us, we have Kelly Isfan, we have Hassan Hutchinson, Candace Philhan, and Kevin Hall. We're gonna ask that everyone keep questions till the end as all the presenters will be at their poster afterwards, so we encourage you to head over and see them and ask uh, any questions that you have at that point. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna present our first speaker here. Uh, so we have Laura Verger, and she's from the Department of Nutritional Sciences in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Okay, thanks so much, Catherine, for the introduction. Um, okay, so as Catherine mentioned, my name is Laura Vergeer and I'm a PhD student in the Department of Nutritional Sciences at the University of Toronto. And today I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've been doing to examine voluntary commitments made by major packaged food and beverage companies in Canada to improve the nutritional quality of their products. And so as I'm sure everyone here is well aware, diet is a major risk factor for chronic disease in Canada. Many Canadians have low intakes of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, or plant-based proteins, but high intakes of calories and nutrients of public health concern, which puts them at a greater risk of developing obesity and other non-communicable diseases. In Canada, our current food supply isn't exactly conducive to making the healthier choice the easier choice for consumers. A large proportion of food products in Canada are highly processed, energy dense, and high in nutrients of public health concern, and many of these less healthy products are often marketed using nutrition claims or child appealing packaging. The food supply and other aspects of the environment in which people make food choices are important contributors to diet quality and health. The food supply is largely influenced by the policies and actions of the food industry in addition to those of governments and society. There are actually only about 10 multinational companies that own or distribute most of the packaged food and beverage brands here in Canada and around the world. These companies control more than half of North American food sales and almost 15% of global sales. Food companies have a lot of control over the formulation, availability, pricing, and promotion of their products, and they can influence government policy initiatives related to the healthfulness of the food supply. And so the WHO and others have recommended that food companies introduce new products or reformulate their existing products to reduce levels of nutrients of concern. And so although it's well established that there's a need for voluntary efforts from food companies to help create a healthier food supply, there's been very little research to evaluate and compare the strength of voluntary policies and commitments made by different companies, especially here in Canada. 
And so with these knowledge gaps in mind, the purpose of this study was to identify and evaluate voluntary policies and commitments made by major packaged food and beverage companies in Canada to improve the nutritional quality of their products with a focus on nutrients of concern, calories, and portion sizes. And I will just briefly mention that this work was completed as part of a larger evaluation of the policies and commitments of major food companies in Canada across several different areas of the food environment using globally developed and applied methodology. And if you're interested in learning more about this, you can find the full report on our lab website. Companies were selected for this study based on Canadian market share data from the Euromonitor database. All of these companies held 1% or more of the national market share as of 2016. And in selecting companies, we focused on commitments at the parent company level, as this is where these types of policies are typically implemented. And so this resulted in a total of 22 companies, representing 52% of the Canadian market share for packaged food and 69% of the market share for beverages as of 2016. We had a mixture of multinational and domestic manufacturers, as well as a couple of Canadian retailers with private label brands. And so from there, we conducted a systematic policy scan of publicly available information on recent uh, efforts to reduce calories or nutrients of concern in companies' products. Um, and we also engaged with representatives of these companies where possible to supplement the data that we had collected from public sources. And we then assessed companies' commitments in terms of whether they spanned multiple nutrients, brands, or food categories, whether they targeted a specific percent reduction, whether they stated their applicability to Canada, if the commitments included baseline and target years, and whether or not they were publicly available. So just to highlight a couple of main results, we found that overall 72% of companies reported recent reductions or an ongoing commitment to reduce sodium levels in their products. And when we looked at companies that only offer beverages, we found that about three quarters reported efforts to reduce the calorie content or portion sizes of their products. And here's just an overview of companies' commitments in terms of the nutrients or components targeted, the target year, the breadth of these commitments across the company's product portfolio, and whether they stated their relevance to Canada. And overall, we saw quite a bit of variation in the strength of commitments made by different companies. And here are just a few examples of targets for added sugars. Unilever's commitment was very specific, but targeted a narrower range of products, whereas PepsiCo made a broader but more vague commitment. Coca-Cola reported fairly widespread efforts to reduce sugars in their foods, while Ocean Spray reported reductions that were less specific and limited to fewer products. We found that overall, Nestle performed best and that they had commitments to reduce levels of several nutrients of concern across their entire product portfolio. And within Canada, they also had a specific commitment to meeting Health Canada's voluntary sodium reduction targets, and they regularly reported their progress. Based on our findings, we recommend that companies implement targets for multiple nutrients of concern that are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely and that span all brands and product categories. We also encourage them to establish sodium targets that align with Health Canada's and to publicly report their progress on a regular basis. So to summarize, we know that food companies play an important role in shaping the food environment and specifically the food supply. Findings from this study help us to better understand current food company policies concerning the nutritional quality of their products and may prompt companies to improve their efforts in this area. I'd like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Mary Labe, Dr. Lana Vanderlee, uh, our other collaborators on this project, as well as my lab mates. And thank you so much for listening. I'd be happy to take any questions later during the poster sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Our next speaker today is Rachel Acton, and she's joining us from the University of Waterloo. All right, thank you. So yeah, I'm from the University of Waterloo, a PhD student there. Um, so today I'm gonna to be presenting results of our study that looked at the influence of sugar taxes and front of package nutrition labels on consumer purchases of protein, calcium, and fiber. 
So as we all know, um, there are countless different factors that contribute to obesity. Um, my research focuses specifically on factors of the food environment. So our food environment includes um, anything from the types of foods that are available to the prices of those foods or to their marketing strategies. And we know that most aspects of our food environment do make it a lot harder to make healthy choices. Um, but recently, there have been more and more efforts to implement policies at the population level to aim to improve the food environment and make it easier to make the healthy choice. And two common population level strategies are sugar taxes and front of package nutrition labels. So first, sugar taxes. Um, most that we see today are taxes on sugar sweetened beverages. So for example, like those in Mexico, the UK, or some cities in the US. Um, some countries have also implemented taxes on sugary foods, but overall these policies aim to increase the price and therefore reduce consumption of um, sugary products. And second, front of package nutrition labels. So these are used to help consumers to interpret and compare the healthiness of products. And here are some examples from France, Chile, and Australia. And these are the ones that we've seen that are proposed in Canada. So given that more and more countries are implementing these two food policies, we wanted to examine whether they actually influence consumers' purchases. So we've previously taken a look at some of the key nu nutrients of concern, which we did found were reduced by these taxes and labels. But there is some concern that these policies may also lead people to reduce their intake of positive nutrients. Um, so these were the focus of this analysis. So our study used an experimental marketplace design in which participants are provided a sum of money and presented with mul multiple products available to purchase. So they get real products and keep their actual change at the end of the study. Um, and using that design allows us to vary the price and labeling of the products and assess how those factors influence participants' purchases. So we compared five different front of pack labels. So participants were randomized to see either products with no front of pack label, a high end label similar to those proposed in Canada, a multiple traffic light label, a health star rating, or a five star nutrition grade. And our study tested three sugar tax conditions. So first we had a control condition where all the products were assigned um, regular market prices. And second, we had a 20% tax on sugars or foods that high, had high sugars. And third was a tiered tax, which just means that products with higher levels of sugar got higher prices and lower sugar got lower prices. So in the experiment, participants completed a series of purchasing tasks, which each corresponded to each of those tax conditions. They, pay, they had $5 for each purchase, and at the end, the computer randomly chose one of those purchases to be the real one, and we gave them their actual food or beverage from that purchase and their change from the $5. So here's a closer look at what the participants saw in each purchasing task. Um, so there were 20 different snack food products available. So they're displayed here just as an example with the multiple traffic light labels and the 20% tax. So you can see there's a wide range of different snack products. And just as an example, you can see here the differences in the traffic light labels between a cheese popcorn and a skinny popcorn. Um, and you can see there's more red traffic lights on the cheese popcorn. And here, the yogurt on the left got a sugar tax because it had higher sugar, whereas the one on the right did not. So we conducted the study in person in three different shopping centers in Ontario. You can see our data collection center in Toronto on the right. And after data cleaning, just under 3,600 participants completed the experiment. And to analyze our data, we used repeated measures in NOVAs to account for the repeated nature of the experiment. So the outcomes that we explored are the nutrient densities of participants' purchases. So nutrient density is just a value representing the amount of a nutrient in a product relative to the amount of calories in that food. So we calculated the protein, calcium, and fiber densities of participants' selections. And obviously, the higher the nutrient density, the better. So what did we find? So in terms of taxes, there were no differences in the protein density or the calcium density of purchased foods across the different tax conditions but we did find that both sugar tax formats actually led participants to choose foods with higher fiber density compared to when there is no tax. And in terms of the front of pack labels, again, we found no differences in protein or calcium density across the different label conditions, 
But again, we found that participants purchased foods with higher fiber density um, if they saw the traffic light labels or the health star rating labels um, compared to those who saw no front of pack label. Um, but how do all these results apply to the real world? So first of all, the selection of snack foods in this study was obviously limited compared to what you would see, for example, at a grocery store. Um, but these results do give us at least some indication of how sugar taxes and front of pack labels might influence our purchasing of some of the positive nutrients in our diet. And bringing it back to the big picture, so there is growing evidence that sugar taxes and front of pack nutrition labels are effective at reducing consumption of things like sugar, sodium, and saturated fats at a population level. Um, but these results expand that evidence, suggesting that consumers' intake of protein, calcium, and fiber may remain unaffected um, as a result of these policies. And in fact, our results suggest that sugar taxes and some front of pack nutrition labels may actually lead to important increases in fiber density among snack food purchases. And overall, these data are a unique and important contribution to guide the ongoing development of the front of pack labels here in Canada, but also tax and labeling systems being developed in other countries. Um, so the study was funded by a Canadian Institute of Health Research operating grant in Sugar and Health um, and an Ontario Graduate Scholarship. And that was a super high level, level overview, so I'm looking forward to chatting in more detail at the poster session. Thank you very much, Rachel. Our next speaker is Monique Putvang Kent from the University of Ottawa. The title of her talk today is Global Benchmarking of Unhealthy Food and Beverage Advertising to Children on Television. How does Canada measure up? Hello, so as mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about a study that I participated in. It was actually led by a researcher in Australia called Bridget Kelly. And uh, there were 22 countries that were participating and uh, Canada got to participate in this study, so. So basically, um, we've known since about the mid-2000s that food and beverage marketing is a determinant of childhood obesity. We know that food and beverage marketing is associated with children's food preferences. It has an impact on their short-term food intake. It has an impact on the foods they ask their parents to buy, and it is also associated with childhood obesity. Now, globally, what we know is that about one in, in five children um, either suffer from overweight or obesity, and that there's been a 10 times increase in obesity in the last 40 years. Now, in less developed countries, there's still, we're still seeing increases in childhood obesity, whereas in the developed countries, there's been kind of a, a slow plateauing of, uh, of obesity rates. Now, in Canada, um, the rates of childhood obesity, as most people know, have increased significantly since the late 1970s. Um, so back in 1978, the rate was just 3%, and in 2015, we were up to 12%. So the combined rate for overweight and obesity in Canada now is uh, almost 31% for children and adolescents. Now, globally, uh, the WHO, in terms of the political context, the WHO endorsed a set of recommendations saying that or countries need to develop food and beverage marketing restrictions, and all of the, or most of the member states signed on to these, uh, these recommendations. And the WHO has also recognized how important food and beverage marketing is and has linked the implementation of these types of restrictions to global nutrition targets for 2025 and also for global targets targets for non-communicable diseases. So they're really encouraging countries to develop food and beverage marketing restrictions. Now, in Canada, that's exactly what we've, we've been doing. So um, as Manny mentioned in the last session, uh, Senator Green Rain introduced a, a bill, Bill S-228, called the Child Health Protection Act a couple of years ago. And basically what this bill says is that there should be no unhealthy food and beverage advertising targeting children at all times in various media and child settings. Um, sponsorship and adolescents have been excluded from this bill, but there has been a commitment to monitoring and there is going to be a review after five years once the, the bill is finally passed for the Senate, which we're hoping for in the, uh, the next month or so. Now, what currently exists in Canada is self-regulation by the food and beverage industry. So in the mid-2000s, 18 of the, the largest food and beverage companies um, pledged to reduce the amount of food and beverage marketing seen uh, or 
that they were going to, uh, to, to put on television and in various other forms of media directed at children. So half of those companies said they weren't going to target children at all, and the other half said they were only going to advertise healthy dietary choices. But I've actually done a significant amount of research looking at the, uh, the Children's Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative, and in fact, um, what we've been able to show is that it's been completely ineffective. So the research questions in this study, first of all, we wanted to find out what children's exposure was to television food advertising, because still, kids still do watch TV about two hours a day. Um, and this was across, as I said, 22 countries. We also wanted to see the impact of various uh, marketing to kids policy interventions that exist. And we also wanted to look at the influence of uh, foreign trade and investment in less developed countries, because there were many less developed countries that participated. So in terms of our methodology, as I said, we, we had data from 22 different countries. We contributed the Canadian data. Um, the data was collected any time between 2012 and 2017. Uh, the number of channels did vary. In Canada, we looked at three um, children's specialty channels. And the age of children also varied amongst the countries. So there were countries from the Asia-Pacific region, South and Central America. Canada was the only North American country from Europe and from Africa. Um, now, databases from the variety of countries were included if all food categories were captured, if there was information on the time that the food was actually advertised, um, if there was a recording, recordings were made on both weekdays and weekends, because there can be a difference sometimes in television advertising, and there was sufficient detail to allow for a classification according to the healthfulness of the product. Now, we also looked at the policy context um, of each country. So in Canada, basically what we did is we recorded two weekdays and two weekends of television. So these were randomly selected days in May and June of 2017. We looked at the top three children's stations in Canada according to Nielsen data. Uh, we taped 18 hours of television a day, so from 6 a.m. to midnight. And the, the age group of the children we were interested in was children between the ages of 2 to 11. Now, we also looked at peak viewing times, so that was the top five-hour time slot, again, um, when, when children were kind of at the maximum audience viewing, and this, again, was based on Nielsen data. Now, in terms of when we started watching all this television um, footage afterwards, all the recordings, what we were, we were looking at was what day, what day the advertising occurred on, what channel, what time, what is the brand name that was featured in each advertisement, what food category type uh, was featured, who is the parent company, um, and we also looked at what marketing techniques were being used, so what types of promotional marketing techniques um, like uh, branded characters and um, licensed characters like Dora the Explorer, and we also looked at premium offers. Now the final thing we did is we assessed the healthfulness of each product that was advertised in our sample, and we used the WHO Regional Office for Europe Nutrient Profile Model, so it's a profi profile model that was developed specifically for food and beverage marketing in Europe, and it classifies foods into permitted or not permitted uh, food categories. And basically, there's a threshold per 100 grams of, of the product that's featured, and some products can't be advertised at all, such as chocolate, candy, cakes, uh, juices, and energy drinks. So those, those categories are always in the not permitted. You don't actually do a nutritional analysis for those ones. Now, in terms of the results, what we found that, first of all, there were four times more um, not permitted food ads than permitted food ads um, in the sample, so not a, a big shock. One of the things that did surprise us, though, um, was that Canada fared so poorly compared to all the other countries. So you can see over here on the, the right-hand side, I'm not sure if my pointer works well there, um, but Canada was it fared the absolute worst with over nine food, unhealthy food and beverage ads in the sample per hour per station. So that means if your child is watching one hour of TV, they'll see nine unhealthy food and beverage ads, so very, very high level of unhealthy uh, food advertising, particularly compared to all the other, the other countries. 
Um, the food categories that we saw advertised the most frequently, I mean, these are, are sim similar to um, other, other research that I've done on this topic. Um, so overall, when we looked at all the countries, other beverages, so those are the soft drinks, chocolate and candy, uh, ready-made food dishes, and uh, breakfast cereals, cakes, cookies, and pastries. And finally, um, in terms of the, the not permitted food ads per hour per channel at peak times, we found that there was much more advertising during the peak times than obviously in the, the non-peak times. So advertisers are really focusing their advertising when, when it's peak. And I'll just skip through this because I'm told that my time is over. I don't know, it didn't, the slides didn't advance automatically like they were supposed to, so. Um, but um, anyways, it, it was quite shocking to us that Canada fared the worst. I think it really shows that um, this, this new bill that is hopefully gonna be passed this spring is, is very needed. And um, anyways, and Health Canada is, is working really hard on those regulations right now that are gonna accompany the bill. So we're looking forward to uh, the big party when the bill is passed, so thank you very much. Thank you, Monique. So our next speaker today is Karen Roberts from the Public Health Agency of Canada, and the title of her talk is Obesity in Canada, Understanding the Numbers. Hi, so my name is Karen Roberts, and I'm a senior epidemiologist with the Centre for Surveillance and Applied Research at the Public Health Agency of Canada. Today I'm going to provide an overview of how we track obesity, including some of the challenges we face in providing meaningful population estimates. I'm also going to present some of FACT's online platforms, which provide national and subnational population health data. Surveillance is the routine collection, analysis, and interpretation of health-related data, and its dissemination to those leading public health action. Due to its burden, obesity is among the many conditions that FACT reports on routinely. The most comprehensive picture of obesity among Canadians requires data from a variety of sources, but methodological differences can make understanding the numbers challenging. The most precise estimates of body composition come from direct measures, but the high cost and complexity of these tools makes them impractical for population level surveillance, where having simple measurement tool is paramount. Indirect methods for estimating adiposity, like BMI, are often used instead. The BMI performs well as a measure of excess adiposity in the extreme ranges, but can lead to misclassification in the middle ranges and among some population groups. Despite its limitations, for surveillance purposes, it's not clear that a superior measure exists. Fixed BMI cut points are used to classify obesity among adults, but given that children experience dramatic body composition changes throughout childhood, age and sex-specific cut points are necessary. Several classification systems exist, yielding inconsistent estimates. So in 2015, FAC and Health Canada released a joint recommendation that the WHO cut points be used for surveillance. The accuracy of the height and weight data used to calculate BMI is central to its precision. Measured data is the gold standard, but it's not always feasible to collect, and self-reported data is subject to respondent bias. Among adults, respondent bias is predictable, and correction equations exist to adjust. To ensure appropriate use and interpretation of, its data, it, of data, it's important to understand the characteristics of a data source. Questions we commonly ask for surveillance include, can we report on all age groups? Can we use the data to report at appropriate levels of geography? How often do we get updated data? How were the data collected? Will we have enough statistical power to detect changes over time or differences between population groups? And finally, can we disaggregate the data according to other factors that will better inform policy or program interventions? At the national level, we have access to several large national surveys conducted by Statistics Canada. Each has its own strengths and weaknesses. Some sources are better designed to provide a snapshot of the state of obesity at a given time, while others are collected on an ongoing basis. But of course, multiple sources and multiple methods ultimately leads to multiple estimates. The following figure shows the most recent prevalence estimates of obesity among adults using measured and self-reported adjusted data. As you can see, the estimates are comparable overall, though one survey shows a significant difference between males and females. Examining obesity estimates among adults over time, in the next figure, 
we can see that unadjusted self-reported estimates shown in the lower line significantly underreport the prevalence of obesity, while adjusted data presented in the upper line and measured data presented using dark blue triangles align very closely. Regardless of the data type, an increasing trend in obesity has persisted since 2000. Looking now at data from children and youth, we only report measured data because correction equations have not yet been developed. The apparent differences in obesity between boys and girls are not statistically significant, but what we can take away from this figure is that in the last decade, rates of obesity among children and youth have remained stable. The use of modeling to predict outcomes can offer great improvements over basic trend analysis. Stackhan's population health model is a micro-simulation model of diseases and risk factors. It combines data from a range of sources, including surveys and vital statistics. The BMI-specific model provides projections of self-reported and measured BMI, which agree well with our survey data. FAC is in the process of developing a report that will describe in more detail the issues I've just discussed. It is expected for release in 2020. In the meantime, FAC currently has several online resources for tracking obesity-related data. Firstly, the Canadian Chronic Disease Indicators is a core FAC surveillance product. Its associated online data tool has a variety of indicators disaggregated according to a range of factors. It provides a comprehensive pan-Canadian resource on the burden of chronic diseases and associated risk and protective factors. The Canadian Chronic Disease Indicators is housed on FAC's InfoBase alongside several other data products, including data blogs. Our 2017 data blog on obesity among adults included inter an interactive mapping feature. Data blogs are added to the InfoBase regularly and the site is easy to search. The Health Inequalities Data Tool is a collaborative effort of FAC, the Pan-Canadian Health Network, StatsCan, and KaiHi, and it builds on a set of indicators of health inequalities. The intended use of this tool is not for routine national surveillance, but rather to provide data on indicators stratified by a range of social and economic characteristics meaningful to health equity. The Physical Activity Sedentary Behavior and Sleep Indicators is another FAC surveillance product. Its associated online data tool will be released this May, and although it doesn't provide information on obesity specifically, it does provide information on sleep and movement behaviors, as well as the factors and environments that can influence them. Finally, the Canadian Risk Factor Atlas, last released in 2008, is being updated and modernized. The new online platform will use Canadian maps to report on key risk factors of chronic disease at the sub-national level and by key social determinants of health. Obesity prevalence from adjusted self-reported data is among the risk factors to be included. And finally, I just wanted to acknowledge my co-authors and colleagues who helped pull together and summarize the content for this presentation and to invite everyone to our poster for more information on the many topics I've touched on. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and to all our speakers for this first Pecha Kucha session. So as we said before, they'll all be at their posters starting probably in about 15 minutes, so you're welcome to go visit them there and ask them any questions that you have. Thank you.
10 minutes. Do you have the sheets? Can I have one of them? Okay. Well, I just got one on there. On the web. Uh, you know, through the email. Hello, everyone. Just to let you know that the luncheon symposium will start in about 10 minutes. Thank you.
Where's Rebecca? So can we can we flash that? Who do I talk to? Okay, so so there's a few glitches here. So let's mm -hmm. let's talk.
There's a timer that says seven minutes. Not food, but. Just take it easy, you know where it is. It's gonna be fine. So your presentation will be fifteen minutes. Uh, you know, you, you know my reservation as well. So, uh, uh, um, I used to know there's some typos so I didn't even know. So you go to the front and you So where will you be sitting if I need you? Yeah, with the lighting, it's very hard to see. You know what? I can't see the timer from here. Can you move it a little closer to the back? Good. So at least I can lean forward, I can see the timer. Because otherwise. We have two one thirty. You know we're supposed to finish in one. People are still coming through, so coming in.
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the luncheon symposium entitled Take Action, Finding Common Ground to Improve Obesity Management. Uh, my name is David Lau. Uh, I'm very honored uh, to uh, chair this symposium. And by way of introduction, I'm an obesity and diabetes advocate, hoping to see a world with fewer and fewer people affected by the problems. And it is my honor to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Shabina Wauji. But before I do that, let, let me sh uh, show you my disclosures that I can be rented but not bought. The most important of which is that I do receive an honorarium from Novo Nordisk who is the sponsor for this uh, educational symposium. And please sign in uh, so that you can get uh, uh, accreditation for attending this uh, symposium, which is accredited. Uh, so without any further ado, let me introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Shabina Walji, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Calgary. Uh, she is the medical director of the Calgary Weight Management Center, uh, which is a very busy clinic, uh, and she has been leading the charge in helping people living with obesity. And you'll find that Dr. Walji, a very dynamic uh, speaker, uh, she will present uh, an accredited program. Uh, this will be followed by questions and answers, so please hold off your questions. Uh, towards the end of the presentation, and there'll be lots of time for discussion. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Walji. So if I step here, can you still hear me? Perfect. So um, thanks, David, for the introduction. Um, it's an honor to be here to present this program today. Um, you know, as you heard, I am a family physician by training. I've been in practice for, well, this year I'm jumping into my 18th year, and when I say that out loud, it's a little too close to, um, to 20 years. And I have to, I think, take some time and think about how I feel about that. Um, but. Anyways, for a good chunk of that time, almost 12 years now, I've been practicing exclusively um, obesity medicine. <clears throat> and I can say that as a clinician that's pretty immersed in this field, um, I'm constantly reminded that um, there is a very broad understanding of obesity and how it should be treated. And I wonder, you know, what will life look like? What will healthcare look like? What will it be like to practice medicine in a world where our understanding of obesity as a chronic disease and how to approach obesity is more uniform? And I know that I'm speaking to a crowd that probably feels uh, similar um, in a way. And so as we move through this program, maybe try to think of yourself as a potential um, change maker to help us achieve such a world. So this is my disclosure slide, and as you can see, I am nowhere near as popular as uh, Dr. Lau is. Um, oops. I don't know what I did. Okay, so you've seen this slide already. Um, I can't see the slides on the front. Uh, on the front computer here. I don't know if the AV group there can load my slides on the front. Um, you've seen this slide already, and all I really have to add is that uh, I too am getting paid an honorarium uh, from Novo Nordisk. And 
To mitigate bias, um, all the content in this program um, has been reviewed by a physician um, steering committee, uh, pharmacist reviewers from all over um, Canada, as well as reputable um, Canadian organizations. Um, all the data has been sourced from clinically accepted evidence, and all the recommendations in this program are in line with best practice, clinical practice guidelines, um, as well as most recently available clinical data. Um, this is the planning committee here, and what you can see here is that this is a group of reputable and uh, respected clinicians from across Canada, many of whom are here today, <clears throat> and maybe even in the room. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about obesity as a complex, multifactorial uh, chronic disease. We're going to talk about some of the biases and barriers to obesity management in primary care, and maybe think about some solutions to this. And we will talk about the different approaches that we have available to treat obesity and look at what some of the um, perceptions are around these options. So it feels a little weird to ask this group this question, is obesity a chronic medical condition? Because I'm pretty confident that we all would agree on the answer, that yes, obesity is a chronic disease. But this is still a really important question to consider, because just because we all may uh, agree that obesity is a chronic disease, not everybody looks at it that way. Our friends, our family members, our colleagues, um, and our patients may see things a little bit differently. And, you know, as it turns out, there are an incredible number of misperceptions about what obesity is and what it isn't, and how it should or could be treated. And I think, you know, if our, um, if our goal is to uh, really um, improve access to evidence-based care for our patients, then we really need to make sure that we understand what these misperceptions are, and we need to figure out strategies to overcome them. Enter the ACTION study. So ACTION, which stands for Awareness, Care, and Treatment in Obesity Management, was a study that investigated perceptions, attitudes, and barriers to weight management in Canadian adults living with obesity, in Canadian healthcare providers, and in Canadian employers. And the data that was uh, collected from, uh, for this study um, was done so using an online survey of a whole host of different topics, including impact of obesity on health and quality of life, motivation to address obesity, and barriers uh, and facilitators for weight loss and weight loss maintenance, as well as perceptions of the role of different obesity treatments. Embedded in this study, or sorry, embedded in this program, you will find uh, different findings from this study. And so, in response to our first uh, question about whether obesity is recognized as a chronic disease, um, the action study found that 60% of patients living with obesity and 94% of healthcare providers do, in fact, recognize obesity as a chronic disease. And it's good that these numbers are high, or on the higher side. Um, it's hard not to take note of the discrepancy, though, between um, uh, healthcare providers and uh, patients living with obesity. So, you know, as potential change makers, what are some of the things that we can all do to help bring these numbers up and maybe close this gap? Well, first of all, we could tell our friends, our family members, our patients, our colleagues that obesity is, in fact, recognized as a chronic progressive um, disease by multiple organizations around the world, including the Canadian Medical Association, the World Health Organization, and um, Obesity Canada, and many, many others. Now, anybody who knows me well knows that I would be likely to launch into a conversation about the complex pathophysiology of obesity, um, because I find that it really helps to understand why obesity is recognized as a chronic disease. <clears throat> There are still um, very many people who believe that obesity is um, the result of a lack of willpower um, around um, eating well and um, exercising more. And, you know, in an effort to challenge this thinking 
And in an effort to engage people in a discussion around this, what I like to do is I like to think about the people around me um, and, and encourage other people to do that too because everybody, everyone in this room I'm sure knows at least one person who seems to be able to um, eat whatever they want, uh, large amounts of highly palatable foods, um, not really exercise very much, but still somehow maintain a relatively lower weight. We all know somebody who seems to be able to do that. And on the flip side, we also know somebody who is very careful about what they're eating, um, watching everything, uh, very nutrition literate, um, exercising regularly, and still somehow uh, seems to defend a higher weight. So when we just think about the diversity um, of the people around us, I think we're reminded that there's more to it than just um, eating and physical activity. We're, reminding that we're reminded that there are other factors that influence our weight. There's genetic factors, there are environmental factors, sociocultural factors, <clears throat> individual factors, other biological factors, medications, sleep, mental health factors, and so uh, many other things that influence our basic biology around energy balance in a way that contributes to weight gain and obesity. And then obesity itself is associated with a myriad of health problems. This is just a, a short list of some of the health conditions there is, that are associated with obesity. Um, it's a pervasive condition and it has the potential to affect pretty much any body system, really. And it's relentless. It just doesn't seem to go away. It keeps coming back. And why is that? Well, it's because the body's really good at defending itself. Um, just as there are uh, programmed mechanisms within the body to defend against changes in blood pressure and in body temperature, um, the body is also designed to defend against changes in body weight. So that when people try to lose weight, we see an increase in the blood level of hormones that contribute to hunger, and we see a decrease in the blood level of the hormones that contribute to satiety. This results in an increase in hunger level, decrease in satiety, and an increase in desire to eat. In addition to that, we also um, see changes in our metabolism, whereby our metabolism slows down and our body burns fewer calories. And these changes, these defenses that occur, make people vulnerable to weight regain. So it really um, doesn't ever go away. And if this isn't chronic disease, then I don't really know what is. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned that it's helpful to talk about these things in an effort to um, increase acceptance of obesity as a chronic disease. Um, but I actually also find these types of discussions to be helpful when talking to my patients um, about weight loss expectations and setting goals. Because, and I'm sure there are a number of people in the audience who would agree, um, many people, and I'm not just talking about patients, I'm also talking about clinicians, have a specific weight number in mind that they believe needs to be achieved. And this number is sometimes uh, arbitrarily determined and not very practical. And you know, given the challenges around weight loss and the challenges around weight loss uh, maintenance, and given the fact that we don't really know uh, who is going to respond to which intervention by how much and for how long, um, it's actually a lot more constructive and effective to focus more on health-related targets as opposed to number-related targets, to really focus on um, or talk about uh, smart, so specific, measurable, realistic, behavior-specific goals um, as opposed to scale-specific goals. And it is very important to help not just patients, but maybe even our friends and our family members and our colleagues to understand their values around weight and health. Because our ultimate goal is really to help patients achieve their best weight. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the concept of best weight, this refers to that weight that is achieved that affords a patient um, the best health while living the healthiest lifestyle that they can enjoy. And this makes sense. Because if obesity is a chronic disease, then it's going to require a long-term management plan 
And for an individual to stick to a long-term plan, they have to enjoy what they're doing. And when we start to approach things uh, more this way, we start to see a shift. And the shift is really, really important because part of the action study <clears throat> was to ask patients and, provide, and providers whether they felt that weight loss was completely the responsibility of the patient. And it was found that 74% of uh, people living with obesity, that is three out of four people, felt that obesity was completely on them. That's a big number. How did healthcare providers do? 23%. Well, I'm, I'm glad that this number isn't any higher than it is. 23%, um, however, is still one out of five, one out of four um, providers who feels that weight loss is completely the patient's responsibility. Now, it's important to bring this to the surface and talk about this because uh, people living with obesity um, are bombarded with negative comments and assumptions that they are uh, lazy and they don't have motivation and that they don't care about their health and they're getting this um, from everybody, really. From friends, from family members, from colleagues, from strangers, and from healthcare providers. And the real danger here um, when patients experience this from healthcare providers is that they're not, gonna, they're not gonna come when they need medical help. And they're certainly not gonna talk about their, their weight. And this is a problem. It affects the therapeutic relationship and um, stuff's gonna get missed. And so as change makers, what can we do? Like how can we make this better? Well, first, we can encourage patient first language. Um, so instead of saying um, the patient is obese, uh, we can say the patient has obesity. And we can make our practice a little bit more comfortable. We can look at the chairs that we have in our waiting room and in our um, examination rooms and make sure that maybe they're um, sturdy and armless or a little bit wider. We can make sure that every examination room has an extra large blood pressure cuff. We can make sure that we have appropriately sized gowns in case we need to ask our patients to disrobe. It's really important, of course, to be able to initiate a conversation uh, about weight with our patients, you know, because um, the action study found that patients with obesity wait over 10 years before ever having a conversation with their providers about weight. 10 years, that's a really long time. And yes, there are many different reasons why this may be the case, but what can we do to make this time shorter? Well, we can start the conversation. For those of you who aren't familiar with the five A's of obesity management, this is a really great tool. Um, and I would encourage you to um, look at it and learn how to use it because it provides a very sensible and sensitive uh, framework to initiate a conversation about obesity with patients and to come up with a patient-centered plan. <clears throat> now, I really can't underscore the importance of asking to talk about weight. Um, it's always easier when the patient brings it up. Of course it's easier when the patient brings it up. However, if somebody doesn't bring it up, we have to be careful about our assumptions. Does it really mean that they don't care and they don't want to talk about it? Or could it mean that maybe they really do want to talk about it, but they um, just don't know how to bring it up? So it's kind of on us to make sure that we're asking to talk about it. And we have to be mindful of our language. We really have to be mindful of our language. And these are real examples that I'm about to give you that we don't want to do. Uh, we don't want to scare our patients and say something like, you know, if you don't address your weight, you're going to die. And we don't want to make our patients feel guilty and say, you know, don't you care about this right now? And we certainly don't want to say something that's, um, what's a polite word? Unsubstantiated. Like, um, maybe if you try putting your fork down in between each bite and not touch it until you finish chewing and swallowing everything that's in your mouth, um, that'll help you with weight loss. Um, that's insulting. 
and it's counterproductive and it's going to affect the therapeutic relationship. We need to be sensitive and we need to be mindful and we need to be medical about this. So we can just say something like, is it okay if we talk about your weight? Um, or we can say, do you have any concerns about the impact that weight might be having on your um, health? And once we have permission to talk about it, then we listen. We listen to our patients and we understand their experience. When did it start? What contributed to it? What have they tried? What worked? What didn't work? Why? How is it affecting their life right now? What is their life context? And once we can see things through our patient's lens, well then we assure them that they're driving, they're making the decisions, right? Um, it is our job to make sure that we are providing them with our expertise, that we're supporting them in a safe way but they get to set the pace and they make, get to make the decisions. And if they decide that they're not really ready to move in any direction right now, well then we invite them to talk about it when, um, when they are ready. Or we ask them if we can talk to them um, at a later date. <clears throat> and of course we continue to manage their comorbidities. Um, and if they are ready, well then we move on. When we are assessing obesity, there's a few things that we need to do. Um, the World Health Organization defines obesity by the body mass index, or BMI, which is a measure of an individual's weight relative to their height. So somebody who has a BMI between 25 and 29.9 is considered to be in the um, overweight category. Somebody who has a BMI greater than 30 is considered to be in the category of obesity. And there are subclasses of obesity, class one, class two, and class three, which correspond to increasing increments in BMI. And I'm so tempted to launch into a, a history of medicine um, lesson around BMI, but I'm not gonna do that because it's not part of the program, but I'm happy to talk to anyone about it after. Um, what I will say though about the clinical use of BMI is that it's a good screening tool. Um, it's good for population-based studies. Um, but we have to remember that it doesn't tell us anything about the body composition of our patient, so we may be under or overestimating adiposity in our patients. It also doesn't discriminate between men and women and people of different ethnic backgrounds, and probably most importantly, it doesn't tell us much about our patient's health. So we need to do other things. Well, we could look at abdominal adiposity by measuring waist circumference, and there are different cutoffs for men and women and people of different ethnic backgrounds. Um, waist circumference gives, an, gives us an idea of uh, an individual's metabolic health risk, but it loses its clinical utility in people who have a BMI greater than 35. So we also need to make sure that we look at other uh, weight-related um, health concerns. And, you know, automatically people tend to think about the metabolic uh, comorbidities like um, blood glucose or blood pressure or lipids. Um, a cardiovascular disease, but remember I mentioned before, this is a very pervasive condition and it can affect um, pretty much any body system. So we have to remember mechanical issues like osteoarthritis. We have to remember things like sleep apnea. We have to remember things like psychiatric comorbidities. Now, many experts like to use the Edmonton Obesity Staging System. Uh, this is a tool that ranks the severity um, of obesity based on the presence and extent, and extent of comorbid uh, medical, mental health, and mechanical health issues. And the nice thing about this tool is that it, um, it tells us a little bit more about the weight-related health risk of our patients, not just the size of the patient. Um, and it could really help with uh, therapeutic decision-making. So, up to now, we've talked about why obesity is a chronic disease. Um, we've talked about the importance of having these kind of conversations with our patients, with our colleagues, with our friends, with our family members. We've talked about being sensitive in the language that we use. We've talked about um, the impact obesity has on health and really setting goals around health outcomes. <clears throat> why do we, why, why, why do we want to do this? Well. Um, according to the ACTION study, 74% of patients living with obesity and 78% of healthcare providers uh, believe that obesity has a large impact on health. So good, these numbers are high. Um, should they be higher? You know, are we remembering that obesity is associated with a myriad of um, 
of health uh, problems. Now, that's not to say that everybody who carries extra weight is going to have all of these health problems or even any of these health problems, but certainly we know that it is associated with a vast number of health problems. What we also know, though, is that um, modest weight loss can lead to significant improvements in health. Just a reduction from baseline of 5 to 10 percent of body weight can result in a reduction in the risk of type 2 diabetes, a reduction in the risk of cardiovascular risk factors, improvements in the severity of obstructive sleep apnea, improvements in pain scores and health-related quality of life, improvements in lipid profile and blood pressure. So what about mortality? Well, a recent meta-analysis found that weight-reducing diets that are low in fat and saturated fat with or without an exercise intervention um, is associated with an 18% relative reduction in premature mortality. So what's the bottom line here? The bottom line here is that when we're having conversations with people about obesity management, we really want to move away from aesthetics and um, the scale and really talk more about the health benefits and the quality of life and the longevity. So now we have a patient in our office that we've had this great conversation with and we understand where they're coming from and we're ready to kind of move on to the next step and they say lots of people are overweight including many people in my in my family I know what I need to do I am um, I don't think I need your help with my weight I feel confident so how do we how do we approach this what do we need to approach this um, how, how common how often do we see this? How often do people feel this way? Well, according to the ACTION study, 55% of patients uh, living with obesity stated that they knew, they know how to lose weight. And 60% feel that if they really set their mind to it, um, they can lose weight. But only 10% reported uh, being able to maintain 10% uh, or more weight reduction for more than a year. So what do we do with this information? Um, well, I think what that tells us is that there's many people who feel confident in managing their weight and they're going to want to try and do it on their own. There's also many people who don't feel confident in managing their weight and they're going to look to us for support maybe a little bit earlier in the journey. And it also tells us that many people struggle with maintaining weight. So what does that mean for us? Well, we need to know what tools are available to support our patients. Now, I just want to preface this slide by saying that you know, new uh, Canadian, clinical uh, Canadian clinical practice guidelines are underway. Um, but this slide reflects the 2006 Canadian clinical practice guidelines on the management of obesity. And what you can see here is that uh, behavior modification is recommended for anybody who has a BMI greater than or equal to 25. When somebody has a BMI greater than or equal to 27 or a higher BMI with uh, some comorbidities, we start to think about pharmacotherapy. And then with an even higher BMI and even maybe more advanced uh, comorbidities, we would start thinking about bariatric surgery. So what do people think about these um, different tools that we have. So I'm going to just pause for a second and I'm going to let you read this. So this is perceptions around uh, the effectiveness of eating habits in patients with obesity and providers. And then I'm going to let you just have a look at this slide, which shows how people feel about the effectiveness of uh, physical activity in long-term weight management among patients living with obesity and healthcare providers. So what's interesting here is that, you know, studies have shown us that interventions that focus on diet and exercise alone don't really produce um, high success rates for long-term weight loss maintenance, and yet uh, patients with obesity and healthcare providers are commonly reporting that these um, tools are effective in achieving long-term weight loss maintenance. 
So what do we mean when we say behavior modification? Well, we're talking about um, attention to nutrition. So this means establishing a healthy balanced eating pattern that uh, helps the patient to achieve their best weight. We're talking about increasing physical activity. And we're talking about cognitive behavioral therapy. And according to our guidelines, these are very important and they are very important, but how well do they work? This was assessed in the look ahead study. Uh, now the look ahead study was a study of, I think about 5,000 individuals who had obesity and type two diabetes. And really the main goal was to determine whether or not an intensive lifestyle intervention would have um, an effect on um, cardiovascular outcomes and weights and cardiovascular risk factors. And so participants in this study were randomized to either uh, receive an intensive lifestyle intervention or uh, uh, kind of a more supportive um, control group. So in the control group, which is called the Diabetes Support and Education Group, um, the individuals participated in three one-hour workshops, group-based workshops, over the course of the year, and they received some you know, basic information on diet and physical activity and social support, but there were no behavioral strategies uh, provided to these individuals. So this kind of parallels maybe what we might see for the most part in primary care, it's usual care. Um, and the intensive lifestyle intervention was intense. They, uh, people in this group received uh, regular one-on-one -on -one visits, they received multiple group workshops, they received uh, refresher courses, they received a personalized um, diet to follow, a personalized exercise plan to follow, they were offered meal replacements um, if they needed it, and they were provided with behavioral strategies like self-monitoring and goal setting and problem solving. And so no big surprise here, um, the people in the intensive lifestyle intervention group fared better. Um, the average weight loss that was achieved in this group was 6.2% after four years compared to the placebo, or not the placebo, the control group that achieved a 0.88% weight reduction from baseline after four years. And there were improvements in blood lipid profile and depression scores and sleep apnea and blood pressure. So what does this tell us? Yes, behavior modification um, is associated with improved outcomes when it's intense. Um, can we do this in primary care? Right now, this is not what primary care looks like. Um, but maybe we can figure out ways that we could increase the level of support that we can provide uh, to our patients so that we can see better outcomes. The reality, though, is that we need um, additional tools uh, to use in our patients to help them achieve and maintain their best weight. Enter. Uh, pharmacotherapy. So based on the action study, it was found that 3% of patients living with obesity and 17% of healthcare providers felt that prescription weight loss medications were an effective treatment for weight management. Now, um, I just want to note that the data collected for this study was collected, I believe, in 2017. And I think the landscape has changed and continues to change. So I'm very curious to see what these numbers look like in five years or 10 years. Um, but these numbers here that you're looking at, they're, um, they're low, right? And so what, does, uh, what do we have available in Canada and what does science tell us about their effectiveness? Well, in Canada, we have Orlistat or Xenical, we have Liraglutide or Saxenda, and we have Naltrexone, Bupropion, or Contrave. And all of these medications are currently indica indicated to treat obesity in individuals who have a BMI greater than or equal to 30 or greater than or equal to 27 with a weight-related comorbidity. And we'll go through each one of these. So Orlistat is an inhibitor of pancreatic lipase. It works in the lumen of the stomach and the small intestine to inhibit pancreatic lipase. And when pancreatic lipase is inhibited, it can't hydrolyze dietary fat. And unhydrolyzed dietary fat can't be absorbed. And so it's excreted in the feces. And this is the mechanism which causes a calorie deficit and ultimately results in weight loss. So one of the major trials that was done with Orlistat is called the Zendos trial. And this was a four-year study 
There were 3,300 participants in this study. Everybody had a BMI greater than or equal to 30 and either had normal glycemia or um, impaired glucose tolerance. And um, everybody received a kind of um, lifestyle advice. And they were randomized to either receive Orlistat, 120 milligrams PO three times a day with their meals, or uh, placebo three times a day and they were followed for three years. And so firstly, what you can see here is that uh, greater uh, average weight loss was achieved in the individuals taking Orlistat at one year and at three years compared to placebo. And you can also see, looking at the categorical weight loss, that there were more people in the Orlistat group that achieved clinically meaningful weight loss of 5% and 10% compared to the placebo group. But what the investigators were really looking at was if there was a difference in time to progression to type 2 diabetes. And what they found um, at the end of four years was that looking at those people who had impaired glucose tolerance at baseline, 18.8% in the Orlistat group compared to 28%, 28.8% in the placebo group um, progressed to type 2 diabetes. This corresponds to a 45% relative risk reduction. Um, common side effects with this medication include oily spotting, delays with discharge, fecal urgency. They're mostly GI, really, in nature. And this can be mitigated by uh, making sure that the patients are aware of what they're eating. So it does require some nutrition literacy so that they know what foods contain fat so that they don't consume a diet that is too high in fat. Well, uh, what about liraglutide? So liraglutide is a GLP-1 analog. Um, for those of you who don't know what GLP-1 is, it is glucagon-like peptide 1, and it's a hormone or an incretin that the body already makes. It is a physiologic regulator of appetite, and its mechanism of action, in that sense, is in the brain. There are a number of GLP-1 receptors all over the place in the brain. And um, GLP-1 uh, works in the hypothalamus to induce that feeling of satiety. And liraglutide has a 97% homology to endogenous human GLP-1. And so it does the exact same thing. Um, its signal is highly localized to the hypothalamus, where it induces satiety. One of the major trials that looked at the efficacy of liraglutide in producing weight loss is called the Scale Obesity and Prediabetes Trial. Um, this was also a very large clinical trial with 3,700 participants in it. And everybody had a BMI greater than or equal to 30 or greater than or equal to 27 with a weight-related comorbidity. And they all received a, a kind of modest diet and, and exercise um, um, advice to follow. And they were randomized to either take liraglutide three milligrams subcutaneously once a day or uh, placebo once a day. And then they were followed uh, for, for uh, everyone was followed for a year. Um, and only those who had prediabetes at baseline were followed for three years. Sorry, I think I forgot to mention that um, nobody in this study had type 2, BD, type 2 diabetes. However, um, they had either normal glycemia or they had prediabetes. And it was only the people with prediabetes that were followed for three years. And what you can see here again is that um, a greater average weight loss was achieved in individuals who were taking uh, liraglutide at one year and at three years, and there were more people who achieved uh, clinically meaningful weight loss of 5% and 10% um, from baseline in the liraglutide group compared to um, the placebo group. Um, the investigators here were also looking at uh, progression to type 2 diabetes in those individuals who had prediabetes at baseline, and what they found was that those in the liraglutide group, the, the percentage of people who had prediabetes pre at baseline in the liraglutide group that progressed to type 2 diabetes was 3% versus 11% in the placebo group, and that corresponds to a relative risk reduction of 80%. 
In terms of side effects, most common side effects here are, again, they're GI in nature, um, with nausea, vomiting, dyspepsia, reflux. Um, and this can really be mitigated if we encourage our patients to follow the appropriate dose escalation protocol. Um, and lastly, we have uh, naltrexone and bupropion. Now, this is a unique combination of two medications that we already have some experience with. Uh, naltrexone is used in addictions. Bupropion is used as an antidepressant and to help with smoking cessation. And these two medications uh, appear to work synergistically in the hypothalamus to help induce um, satiety and reduce hunger. And they also appear to work in the mesolimbic circuit to, uh, to mitigate reward-driven eating behavior, um, but we don't know exactly the neurochemical um, mechanism of actions of how um, this is happening. A major trial that was done looking at the effectiveness of naltrexone bupropion in weight management is called the CORE-1 trial. And uh, this was a trial of roughly 1,100 participants, all who had a BMI greater than or equal to um, 30 or greater than or equal to 27 with a weight-related comorbidity. They were provided with uh, diet and exercise advice, and they were randomized to either receive naltrexone bupropion, two pills twice a day, and each pill contained eight milligrams of naltrexone and 90 milligrams of bupropion. Um, versus uh, placebo, and they were followed for one year. And again, what we can see here was in the pharmacotherapy group, there was an, a greater average uh, percent body weight reduction achieved compared to the placebo group. What we can also see is that, again, there were more people who achieved clinically meaningful weight loss um, uh, in the um, naltrexone and bupropion group compared to the placebo group. So we're consistently seeing here that with pharmacotherapy, we're able to achieve greater weight loss and uh, more people um, are achieving clinically meaningful weight loss compared to the placebo and diet and exercise alone groups. So in terms of safety, um, again, mostly GI in nature, nausea, vomiting, dyspepsia, diarrhea. Um, some people will complain of headaches and dizziness and dry mouth. But we can manage these side effects by, again, making sure that patients are following the dose escalation uh, protocol as it's meant to be followed. So that leaves us with bariatric surgery. So as part of the action study, people were asked about their perceptions on this. And what they found was that 3% of patients living with obesity and 43% of healthcare providers uh, felt that bariatric surgery was effective for weight management. This is our gold standard. So isn't this interesting? So what about bariatric surgery? I, I'm not going to talk too much about um, the details of these surgeries because I'm pretty sure I'm going to chew my words trying to explain uh, the anatomical changes. Um, but the surgeries that have been found to be effective um, in producing long-term weight loss include a vertical sleeve gastrectomy, a Rouen-Y gastric bypass, and a biliopancreatic diversion. And these, surgeon, uh, these surgeries are all restrictive in nature. And there's a malabsorptive uh, piece to it as well. But what's really interesting about these procedures is that they change our biology. Um, these are physiologic surgeries. And so they change our physiology around energy homeostasis in a way that helps with not just weight loss, but weight loss maintenance. And so here, we're seeing weight loss outcomes of 20 and 30 and 35%. So this is a very effective tool that we have. Bariatric surgery for severe obesity is associated with decreased overall mortality. And 
you know, in addition to just weight loss, we're also seeing improvements in a lot of weight-related comorbidity, like type 2 diabetes, like high blood pressure, like dyslipidemia, pregnancy outcomes, um, sleep apnea. And so, you know, I think the important thing here to remember is that it's not a magic bullet. Um, we don't have a magic bullet to treat obesity, but it is a very effective um, tool that we have available to use or to suggest for some of our patients. Um, now with bariatric surgery, it's still important to follow up with our patients because we need to make sure there's no nutritional deficiencies and we still need to um, kind of monitor them to prevent uh, or intervene if there's any weight regain. So that's really the nuts and bolts of uh, this particular presentation. And what I'm hoping was clear was that there are a lot of mismatches in perceptions between patients living with obesity and healthcare providers, as well as mismatches between just people in general, people's perspectives around obesity and obesity management, and what our, our guidelines are telling us to be um, effective interventions. And what I'm hoping is that you'll be able to take and think about some of these mismatches, uh, mismatches and maybe figure out or come up with some strategies that um, you can take back to your clinical settings with you to um, help maybe uh, create a world that is more homogenous in their understanding of obesity and obesity management. And that's all I have to say. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Walji, for the comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, the floor is open for discussion, and please feel free to use the microphones on each side. Um, and uh, please identify yourself and, um, and ask the question. Um, maybe I'll start by asking uh, you, uh, Shabina, in terms of what are some of the important messages that you would like uh, all of us to, to take home in terms of, number one, uh, there's so much bias and stigma against obesity. Uh, what can we do as healthcare professionals uh, differently after we finish with this symposium? Well, I think probably one of the most important um, things to do when, is that me? When addressing um, weight bias is to make sure that we really understand the uh, biology of uh, body weight regulation and eating behavior and all the different factors that can influence um, that can influence this body weight to create biology because I think that will help us move away from this idea that um, you know it's purely a, 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 a willpower issue and I think the more we understand that and the more we talk about things that way um, not only will our own perceptions and approaches shift but I think that of the people around us will shift as well. As you mentioned, uh, health behavior or healthy behavior intervention certainly uh, is still a cornerstone management of, of overweight and obesity. But on the other hand, the results are relatively modest and we need to continue to uh, support and motivate our patients living with obesity uh, to adhere to that. Um, so what, can, uh, what kind of message should we uh, tell healthcare providers in terms of um, the additional tools that are available to help them, such as pharmacotherapy or bariatric surgery, and increasingly, should that be considered as part of the integral management strategies? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think what struck me the most about the results of the action study was um, how few, if I can use that word, healthcare providers um, understand pharmacotherapy and bariatric surgery as being effective um, tools that we can use to manage uh, obesity. So I think one of the first things that maybe people in the room here need to do is to, um, to really try to educate our peers 
um, on the effectiveness of these other um, tools that we have. Any questions from the audience? All I can see is bright lights there, so I don't know if there's people standing under the mic or... Okay. <laughs> Shabina, just a quick question about uh, the medications that you talked about. So, so we get it that very few patients look to medications as a solution. What, what in your own practice do you see are the main barriers, apart from the financial barrier, obviously, the cost of these medications? Uh, what do you see in terms of patients? How do patients respond when you, when you make a recommendation that, that they could be using one of these medications and the fact that they would probably have to use these medications for a long time? So uh, that's a really good question, and I'm careful not to introduce, um, no, that's not what I want to say. Um, I think what I want to say here is the big challenge that I see when introducing the idea of pharmacotherapy really occurs when patients don't uh, appreciate obesity as a chronic disease. And so my strategy really is to spend a lot of time with patients helping them to understand why this is a chronic disease and why we need to be really treating this the same way we treat other chronic diseases like diabetes or high blood pressure, where uh, we have pharmacotherapies that are incredibly helpful to help them achieve their health targets. And I help them when they ask me how long do they need to be on the medication, I help them to understand that as with any other chronic disease, if we withdraw treatment, so if we withdraw a blood pressure medication or if we withdraw a medication for diabetes, we're going to see the disease come back. And so that helps them to accept uh, the idea of long-term therapy. Dr. Sharma is asking an excellent question, but I think a lot of stigma also among healthcare providers, in particular primary care providers, in terms of the concern about prescribing uh, anti obesity or weight loss medication, has to do with uh, the potential harm. Would you like to comment on uh, what about the newer agents that are now available, uh, where we have loracotide as well as bupropion, naltrexone combination? Mm -hmm. So. Um, I mean, these medications to date, with the evidence that we have, appear to be relatively, um, uh, relatively safe. Um, I think what we again need to do, but I think what we again need to do is to educate clinicians about the options that are available because many, provi many providers in primary care aren't even aware of these newer agents or of their um, safety profiles. Ragotide, there, there is the LIDA trial, which actually confers CV outcome benefit in people with type 2 diabetes to the extent that the FDA did not require um, any CV outcome studies using uh, Liracotide 3 milligram uh, with uh, the uh, other compound that has been approved in the states, such as Locasterin. Uh, there's a, a recent CV outcome trial which uh, showed CV safety, in other words, non inferiority compared to. Uh, placebo, um, and in the interim analysis of the of the light trial using naltrexone with propion combination, uh, there was also no uh, safety signal uh, uh, concerns. Uh, perhaps that's something that we should emphasize to uh, to uh, healthcare providers that we now have a newer generation of of anti obesity medications that might be safe, um, and and. Obviously. For, for sure, because the history uh, hasn't. And it's, it's clearly important to emphasize that obesity is a chronic disease, thereby requiring a long-term solution, in which case, as adjunct to health, healthy behavior intervention, pharmacotherapy, and in selected individuals, bariatric surgery are certainly viable options. I think there's a question over there. Hi there, my name's Maureen. I'm an occupational therapist at the Medicine Hat Bariatric Specialty Clinic. Um, I just wanted to bring back a bit of a conversation, if you can, about uh, how we define success with our clients, because I feel that as we move into more of the discussion around less based on weight outcomes, uh, but we always seem to slip back towards it, right? And you talked a little bit about not setting weight loss goals with patients, but I think often, so often we are discrepant and we want people to not focus on that, but then when you define success, 
every other slide that was presented or every other piece of definition is totally based on weight loss. Oh, right, right. So just yeah. like drawing attention to that mis-messaging and I find that within our practice as well, we're very focused on other types of success right up till surgery and then all of a sudden it's about are they successful or not? Has their surgery been successful or not? I'm curious to know if you have any insights as to how we can kind of improve our practice from an interdisciplinary perspective to keep focused on those patient goals um, instead of always bringing back those weight goals because I think we actually perpetuate the issue with the clients because we go back to weighing every time they come in, talking about percentage of losses. How can we be better at doing that, um, defining success in other ways? Mm -hmm. That's a really good point that, you know, when you do look at the literature, when we're looking at effectiveness, we are looking at, we are looking at numbers. Many of the studies also look at other health, health outcomes as well. Um, personally, in my in my personal conversations with my patients, um, this is a challenge and it is very, very hard to move away from weight goals. Um, we are a weight management center, but we try so hard not to talk about weight, uh, which, is, which is ironic. Um, how can we at the front line encourage people to move away from weight? Um, again, I feel like conversations about biology, how the, how the body works, um, focusing conversations of best weight to be uh, very helpful. They aren't always accepted, I think, by patients, and it takes multiple conversations about these things. Um, how can we encourage patients to find some of the other health benefits? Well, again, I think that goes back to really um, uh, exploring the, their values around weight and exploring their values around health and and exploring other things that will make them feel healthier more than just the scale. It's not an easy task. Well, I certainly agree that we need more clinical trials that are focused more on improvement of health uh, as outcomes rather than just weight-based outcomes. Uh, but that said, there are a number of conditions uh, that do improve with uh, reduction in excess body fat. So as we move towards uh, a, a newer definition of ABCD, uh, which stands for adiposity-based chronic disease, we really need more uh, clinical trial looking at the health outcomes in terms of related to excess adiposity. So I think your points are very well taken. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, hello. Um, Manuel from uh, Heart and Stroke. Um, I think you're familiar that there is momentum towards the development of a national pharma care program. It's being discussed. There's an advisory council, etc. Uh, one potential outcome of a, a of a future pharma care program would be the development of a hopefully robust common formulary. Do you see that it might be possible if we, ev when, um, if we eventually develop a, a common formulary in this country that weight loss drugs could be part of that formulary? I'm not familiar whether they actually are part of provincial formularies right now, but what's your thinking about whether it will be realistic that they could be included in a common formulary as part of a national pharmacare program? I'm going to divert that one to David, I think. Okay. Well, at the present time, unfortunately, uh, literally all the health authorities across the provinces and territories still consider obesity more as a body image and, and, and lifestyle issue. Uh, so it's not considered, number one, as a chronic disease. Uh, so anti-obesity medications are not covered uh, and even third-party insurance uh, may not necessarily cover uh, anti-obesity medication. So I think you're bringing up a very important point, and that in part explains why many of us uh, step out of the medical arena to become uh, obesity advocates to basically highlight the fact that we're now uh, not focusing on body image or just the size of the individual, but we're focusing on improving health. And therefore, as part of the solution, uh, the anti-obesity or weight loss medications that help to kickstart the healthy behavior changes and to sustain uh, the 
uh, condition and help to maintain the weight loss and pre preventing weight regain, that should be part of the solution. Uh, because clearly obesity is not a lifestyle issue, is not just because of the poor will of the individual. It is largely genetically based, influenced by the social, environmental, and many other factors. So I think it's time to end the blame game and to start focusing seriously on, the, uh, on obesity as a chronic relapsing disease associated with many, many chronic uh, comorbidities or other diseases. So thank you for bringing that up, Manuel. Any other comments? I'm Pooja Malik. I'm a, phys a family physician in Toronto. I'm just looking for some practical tips or advice for patients that you may treat who have obesity comorbid with a mental health condition like depression or binge eating disorder. Um, if that sort of influences your pharmacotherapy that you might choose or other supports that you usually offer these patients aside from sort of normal management. So certainly we know that mental health barriers are um, very common in patients who have obesity. And uh, that can be a really uh, a tough challenge to encounter both for the patient and for the provider. I encounter that um, regularly. Um, from my perspective, it is, it's really hard to manage obesity if the comorbid mental health conditions aren't um, adequately controlled, so making sure that their mental health status is um, as controlled as we can get it is really, um, really, really foundational, I would say. Um, in terms of that affecting uh, pharmacotherapy choices, for sure it does. Um, but there are also lots of other things that we need to consider when we're um, looking at pharmacotherapy. Um, and I'd have to think about what are my goals. So in somebody who, um, you know, has binge eating disorder, then, and, and if that's a barrier to weight management, then I would be looking at uh, pharmacological options to treat binge eating disorder. Um, in somebody who has um, depression, um, I may be leaning more towards naltrexone bupropion if, I mean, looking at the rest of the patient's health profile, that's an appropriate choice for them because bupropion can be an adjunct um, to uh, the treatment of depression if they're already on something for depression. Does that kind of answer your question? I'm sorry I can't see you because there's a light right above you, so I'm, I'm looking in that direction, but does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I just have one follow-up question. Um, have you, in your practice, encountered patients who sort of had mild to moderate depression that may have been fairly well controlled that got worse after weight loss? I mean, I, I've seen both scenarios where things got worse versus got better. And, and just any tips, I mean, other than just regular check-in screening to make sure that that's not happening with your obesity patients, if you have any tips for me. I actually have seen that uh, quite a few times, and invariably, um, when I reflect, it has been associated with some sort of trauma that occurred in that individual's life um, where weight became a protective thing. And so uh, when that has happened in my patients, it has provided an opportunity to maybe explore some of that. And I've had to rely a little bit on my allied health care team to help address some of that. Any other questions from, from the audience? If not, um, thank you very much, Dr. Walji, for the presentation. And I'd like to thank you all for taking the time uh, to join us for this luncheon symposium. I'd like to thank Novo Nordisk for sponsoring this uh, symposium. And thank you again for coming. Have a great afternoon. Good job.
Well, thank you for a great job. You've done a marvelous job in terms of making 